And I see one victim. I see three victims. Film Factory is first. Hello, Critter. How are you doing today? Taking so long. Oh, this is long. You're a new name I haven't seen before. Who are you, Film Factory? Are you having a good day? That's pulled up on it. Hey, James. I think I just figured out why this wasn't working right. So I might also have made the problem irrelevant as well. This would I eventually get on the inside? How are you doing today? There it is. Actually, that thread's on correctly now. That was it. Okay, so now I know why that was not working right. That is not what I asked you to do. Yes. Okay, it's still updating. Update all. We need victims. Happy, yummy, tasty victims. <coughs> yep. I got the dinner bar. So that'll be easier for people to hang on to. 
So this would be the one weight. And then I also found out I can do the whole entire set with only five pounds of sand, just making it modular. And I could actually make it as granular as a, just by including one empty one, I can make it one pound, two pound, three pound, four pound, or five pound. Just by including one empty one. So the whole thing's modular. It's, um, I gotta see how many grams these take. But um, when you do one pound, you just put one of these in. When you want to do two pounds, you put an empty one of these in the middle, and then a filled one on each end, that's two pounds. Then you put a filled one in the center, that's three pounds. Then you go back to an empty one in the center and four filled ones on the outside, that's four pounds. And then a filled one in the center, and that's five pounds. Hey, Crimson, how are you doing? Um... I was running into a problem where, um, I gotta start taking it apart anyway, where the, um, the soda caps would fit on one end, but not the other end. Um, I wasn't sure why, but I just figured out why. Okay. Cap. Huh. Cap ran away. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> but now I know why it wasn't working. But the whole thing is modular and comes apart. Doing not too bad. Keeping my victims happy. Okay. This. In here. Oop. Gotta take off the cap. There we go. Ooh, that actually cinches down nicely. Oh no, there it goes. Yeah, I do have to redesign the caps a little bit, but that is an easy modification to make. The red one goes on a little better. Some work a little better. And I think it's, I wonder, does it have, yeah, the ones with the little blue seal inside are able to go on like that. But the ones without the blue seal aren't able to go on. And that actually makes sense now that I understand the mechanics of how that works. Okay, now it's starting to make sense. So this would be the either center empty. <laughs> that one cap just keeps coming off. This would be either the center empty four pound configuration or the all five of them full five pound configuration. And if my big hand can fit through there, then any normal hand can fit through there. And now you can just throw all these weights, whatever exercises you need to do. And it's fully modular between one and five pounds using one set. Um, I'm, this is going to be something I'm going to give away. It'll be on my, it'll be for sale on my, um, my digital page, but it's also going to be free. Because this is something that I want to pass around to other people in other parts of the country. They have a local physical therapy center with a, an older community like mine, you know, old people who are on a fixed budget who can't afford to buy stuff. Um, it'll only cost you about 10 bucks of, not even, uh, five bucks of filament to print this. And a, um, a $5 bag of sand should make like 10 sets of these, anywhere between five and 10 sets. So you're looking at less than a dollar's worth of sand. Um, and you'll be able to make a complete set that you could, um, you know, donate to your local physical therapy center for the older folks who can't afford much. Now they can, uh, you know, afford to make it. I want to make it so cheap that there's no excuse not to be able to provide for them. Um, I'd love to get these down to five millimeters thick. Um, because right now they, these are my biggest mass consumption. They're 186 grams of plastic. Where are those things? Um, but the 10 millimeters thick should make this strong enough that you could print it in PETG and actually give it to people. This should survive a fall. I got to test it. I got to fill all five with sand and then see if this survives the impact with the ground. But I think the one millimeter nozzle, the three perimeters, and the 10% infill hex that's open 
should make this flexible enough. See how nice and flexible that is? You can really give that a decent flexing and it doesn't break. Um, that should be flexible enough that this should survive a fall and a hit with the ground. Or getting kicked or sat on or something like that. So um, that will avoid the need to use TPU. Which is not bad. I mean, even TPU is only going to cost $10 per set. But that's none of the reason why I'd like to get down the scale. If I can get the scale down a little smaller. Like with TPU, I could probably get away with making these 5 millimeters thick. And using a 0 0.8 millimeter nozzle. Which is a... Um, that'll knock 90 grams off the mass of these. And knock 20% um, off the mass of the entire set. Just going from 1 millimeter to... 0.8 millimeters, and because it's TPU, it'll still be strong enough. Um, and you can get TPU for 21 to 24 dollars a kilo. Buy a single half kilo for um, 15 bucks. So a person could buy one 15 dollar roll of filament and print this out, and then buy a five dollar bag of sand and have tons of sand left over. Um, or if you live in a sandy climate, just get sand from outside. Um, I think I might actually print the caps instead of using bottle caps. Although I did just solve the bottle cap problem. Um, see, right now it's a little loose. The idea is to use the bottle caps to pinch the parts together and give it rigidity. Um, the problem is this has to be a perfect mate in order to use the bottle caps. Because the bottle caps are a fixed size. And the other problem I'm running into is that they're also different dimensions. Like this bottle cap is different from this bottle cap and different from this bottle cap. So they're not all exactly the same size. They're mostly the same size. So I have to make this... Um, hey, Ben. i got to make the tolerance where this fits on here tight enough that tightening the cap pinches the um, parts together. Um... Now, the easiest way to do that would be to um, just print my own nuts and have those nuts not seal the end, have them be passed through so they can go deeper. But again, that flange requires precision. All right, in order for the flange to work, it would have to be designed to within a half a millimeter tolerance. Otherwise, you either be too tight and not enough threads on the cap, or you'll be too loose like this. Like here, I'm off by one millimeter, and it makes that big a difference. Um, if I had a pass-through cap, like a cap, if I designed my own soda cap that was taller, well, now I'd have a variance in how tight I can make the cap. Um, so printing my own cap eliminates the need to make this so precise, and that if your printer prints a little too big or a little too small, you'll lose the precision. So if I make my own cap, I eliminate that problem. Um, but I lose the ability to use off-the-shelf bottle caps, which actually saves a couple hours of printing time, to be honest with me. That's, 10 ca that's uh, 11, 12 caps, because there's going to be six of these. Each set will include six of these tubes, because you need five filled ones and one empty one in order to get a full one, two, three, four, five-pound set. Um, not quite one pound each. These are just under a pound. Although with the plastic, they might be at a pound. Uh, but when you add the mass of the rig, it's close enough. This is not scientific work. If they're lifting 0.95 pounds, it's not going to make a difference. Um, but I like the design. I think this is going to work. I like the rigidity. Um, oh, I figured I had a problem with the design, but I solved it this morning. I'll show you. Interestingly enough, I also like the fact that they have to assemble it because it creates a little bit of a dexterity problem for them. So it's like a little puzzle. And usually these people with physical therapy have a dexterity issue. So this little puzzle work is good for them. So each end is a wishbone. I just All I had to do is make sure... Well, first of all, I made sure everything can fit on a 200... Um, <coughs> <coughs> Um, within a 210 millimeter build volume, so that anything a Prusa, Ender 3, um, um, 
Idea Maker, whatever printer you have, it'll be able to print all these parts. Um, now, because we're not using water anymore, it's no longer required that you use a one millimeter nozzle. You can print these with a regular nozzle. You just need to make sure you use enough wall thickness to make up the difference. So, for example, if you're using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, you'll have to print the bottles with um, three perimeters. That'll give you a 1.2 millimeter wall thickness. And you'll have to print this with six perimeters. Now, the only problem with this is um, the infill is not thicker when you increase the number of perimeters. My infill is a one millimeter extrusion, but no matter what settings you use with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, your infill is going to be a 0.4 millimeter extrusion. So you're going to need to over extrude your infill and you're going to need to um, increase the percentage density. So you could probably get away with pushing a 0.4 to a 0.6, meaning tell it extrude um, 150% for infill um, width. And then, um, um, <coughs> increase the percentage to like 15% or 20%. Delval, Texas, nice. Yeah, when, you, when you're starting to get a little creaky and up there in age, RV life can be rough. You gotta climb those stairs every time you get in. You gotta move around everything and move around each other. Unless you have a really big RV. Yeah, that, that, gets, that gets tough. The K1 Max? No. Um, they haven't sent me one, so no, I have not tried one. But what I like about this out of Pet G is that this is strong. Look at this. I mean, I could really... Look at how much I could twist that. And it just doesn't care. <laughs> I actually don't think I could break this if I wanted to. So I'm pretty confident that this will not only survive a fall, but provide the shock absorbing that the whole structure needs to avoid breaking on a fall. Um... I am worried about the fact that a lot of that force is going to be focused on the necks of the bottle. Um, but we'll have to see. I'll have to do some drop testing and see how that works. But this came out great. The only problem is it's a filament pig. It's used a lot more filament than I want. I may try to go down to a 5 millimeter thickness, which will knock 50% off of the filament usage. Um, but I really like that. that. That came out nice. Just, I love how that came out. And the, the Vision Miner Nanopolymer worked fantastically absolutely no peeling whatsoever um the from what i've seen the quality of the build of the machine looks like it's pretty good um but the um most of the issues people seem to be complaining about appear to be things that can be fixed in firmware and if they're going to compete with somebody like bamboo max they're going to have to stay on top of their firmware so hopefully we're going to see some updates from them Oh, you're going to, oh, dude, you're lucky. You're going to have the, um, the, um, the, the, um, what is it? The full solar eclipse. Is it, it's going to pass right over Austin. Vision Mile and Pan Nanopolymer is amazing. I mean, I'm printing full bed things directly on the aluminum bed and nothing is lifting. I am very, very impressed. And I haven't had to reapply. That was my big concern. That stuff's expensive. It's 60 bucks for the big bottle. Um, but I haven't had to reapply it yet. It's been great. So, you know, if I have to apply a tiny bit every now and then for a particular print, that's fine. I am very, very impressed with it so far. Um... So those printed fantastically with absolutely, you know, you see there's no warping whatsoever. They're absolutely straight as an arrow. And now the problem I ran into was the bottles. So this is vase mode, of course. Um, one end is open so that you can fill it with sand. And then the idea is you'll be able to close it by simply using a bottle cap. And that works great. Now, the other problem is um, I made this end solid with, you know, four bottom layers. Now, the reason for that is not because this needs to be sealed, because we're going to put a bottle cap on this. Um, the reason for that is bed adhesion. 
A, a dozen is perfect. I'm perfectly happy with a dozen. I'd be totally thrilled with a dozen. Um, the reason I have bottom layers is to improve bed adhesion because nanopolymer or not, you print something like that on just a single perimeter and you're, you're asking for it to knock over. Um, so I added a bottom layer to improve the surface area that it attaches to, but that bottom layer is actually a problem. See, the, the way these caps seal, let me use a, a light color one so you can see it. So if you look inside the bottle cap there, you'll see that there's that, see that little lip on the inside of there sticking up? It is, yeah, see it right there? That little lip right there? Is that ring inside there? That little ring inside there. The problem I was having, I'll show you. Every time I'd put the cap on the sealed end, it, first of all, it wouldn't go on. And then I'd turn it and it would just pop off, see? It, it just keeps popping off. It won't stay on. And it's because of that. It's because of that bottom layer. That bottom layer is hitting that ring in there and preventing the cap from going on all the way. Normally, that ring... No, no, this is single wall. This is one millimeter thick. It's single wall. It doesn't need to be double wall. Um, on this one here, it's all about using as little plastic as possible because the less plastic I use, the less time it takes to print and the less money it costs for people who are donating these to, um, physical therapy centers. So the reason it works on this end is because part of the cap actually goes on the inside. Okay. So part of this cap actually goes inside the bottle. So it, it's actually forming a, a, a link like the, a one millimeter. I'm using a one millimeter nozzle. So it actually, the bottle cap actually looks like this when it goes inside, when you put it on. So part of the bottle cap is actually on the inside and then the rest of the cap is on the outside. And because I sealed that end, that part on the inside can't go in. So it's colliding with that and then it pops off. So the, the easiest solution is to print it without bottom layers. Um, and see if it works. See if it stays stuck. I mean, it's only 40 grams of plastic if it fails. Um, so if, now to fix this one, I'm just chopping off the, the bottom here. Let me try this, although this is dangerous. Get it in position. Then make sure no part of my body is in the way. This is asking for it. Makes me jump every time it does it. Because, <laughs> man, if that pops off, that's going to hurt. If it hits me. I think I got it. Yeah, I'm inside now. Okay, there we go. Create an opening. So using PETG and a one millimeter nozzle. There we go. So now what I have to do is remove this bottom layer. And then the cap goes on perfect. I'll show you in just a second when I tear this off. There we go. Now that I've removed the bottom layers, now the cap goes on fine and tightens down just fine. So that was the problem with that. Um, I didn't realize that there was that hook structure on the inside of the cap, and I was blocking that. Uh, no, that won't work because it's um, four layers thick. And so that's a 0.6 millimeter first layer, then 3.2 millimeter layers. So that's two, four, six. It's 1.2 millimeters thick. By the time I use an external deburring tool, I'd be tearing up the threads. Um, oh, that actually didn't go on straight. Oh, because there's probably still debris left. Oh, it's um, I took off too much. It's missing a section now. Yeah, I, I foobarred that. Now I gotta take it off even all the way around, which is gonna give me less threads. Yeah, dummy. Oh, uh, now it just made it worse. Oh well. But anyway, um, I know what the problem is now. 
Yeah, that, that made it worse. Okay, so that's not going to work. I'm going to mess up too many of them doing that. Now, the other solution is that actually might solve one of my other problems is that um, I need the tolerance to be tighter. So the way this works, this goes on here, and then this threads onto here. So as you can see, I'm off by about three millimeters there. So now instead of pinching it, this is able to jiggle. Uh, I need this to actually pinch this because that's going to hold this steady and stabilize this. So the solution is I could keep fine tuning this piece here until the conical section that it covers pushes it up into the cap. So I need that to push up into the cap. Since I can't make the cap go further down, I need to push this up into the cap. That means the cross section of this piece here needs to be fine-tuned. Now, I could fine-tune it manually. I could put some tape there, which is going to make a tighter fit. But, uh, um, Or I can print a washer, but now it's more parts, which I'm trying to avoid. Um, or I could just get rid of the non-printed part. I could... Um, Go with a 3D printed cap. The advantage of going with a 3D printed cap is multifold. First, it's not going to use much plastic. Even though I need 12 caps, it's not much plastic. Um, if you dedicate one of your smaller printers to printing caps, you do all 12 in one shot. Um, the advantage of printing a cap is that I can do something you can't do with a bottle cap, and I can make the threaded section longer. By making the threaded section longer, the cap will now be able to screw down into and push against this piece here, which will tighten up my entire structure. And because I'm printing the cap myself, I don't need that little J-hook on the inside there. That's on the inside of the cap that's preventing the problem, which means I will no longer have a problem with closed-end bottles not threading properly. Um... The, one of the primary reasons why using bottle caps was important was because I was trying to use water. So this one here is water. Um, but the, the nature of water is that it's actually a lower density than um, sand. So one pound of water is this big. One pound of sand is this big. So the sand is actually significantly more dense which means it takes a lot less plastic to make the parts. The whole thing becomes smaller. Well, now that I've decided to use sand, um, even though water is free out of the tap, water has another problem where you have to actually pressure test every part you print to make sure it actually holds water. Oh, you could fit 12 of these on one sheet. But yes. Not only does water have to be pressure tested for each one you make, there's one mistake, and it doesn't work. Um, but if you drop this and so much as crack it, it's going to leak. Sand, a lot less messy. And because I've now found out that the sand is going to cost like a buck, I'm going to go the sand route. Now that I'm going the sand route, for both making the part smaller and for making the... Um, well, it doesn't matter if the water goes bad. It's not doing anything. It's just being mass. So it doesn't matter if it goes bad. It's not like you're going to drink it. <laughs> um, <coughs> but um, now that I'm not using water, I no longer need to use bottle caps because I no longer need a watertight seal. The whole point of using a watertight seal was that the seal for a bottle cap is on the cap for a soda bottle. And it's that J-hook that it's that shape that hooks onto the inside of your bottle that makes it watertight. That's what makes it actually watertight. The lip of the soda bottle is actually um, you know, a tight fit around that little um, hook seal in there. And so your compression sealing it when you tighten the cap down. The reason that one cap worked, was it this one? Not that one. There's one cap that worked, and that was because it was that new crappy style of um, seal. I'm trying to find one. I have one of them here that uses that style.
Not for that one. Come on, where is it? I know it's here. Where is it? Oh, that must be the one I dropped. Yo, no, I, I, I showed it momentarily in the video. The, um, the newer style that's not as good is the type that has yes. Instead of having the hook um, seal around the inside of the cap, it has a little blue, it has a second piece. See, this is one piece. This cap is one piece of plastic. Some of the newer caps are two pieces of plastic. You have the plastic cap without that little ring inside, and then there's an additional blue piece of plastic that gets stuffed inside, and that's the seal that seals the bottle cap. Because that one didn't have the ring inside, it fit on the bottle. Now, I guess I could also... I could also remove... Well, that'd be a pain in the ass. And it might be possible for me to get rid of that seal in there, but boy, would that be a pain. Now, the easier thing to do would be to... Um, there's two ways. I could cut out the center of this to allow this to thread on further. And that's, that's getting finicky. I'd rather just print my own at that point. So at that at this point, I think I'm just going to print my own cap and then increase the number of feds. And by increasing the number of threads, I um, fix my fitment problem where these are loose. Because now I'll be able to tighten down the cap until it compression fits against the unit. One of them does. I think it's one I dropped. Because I can't find it. So I must have dropped that one. This, no, that one's got water in it. Is it the last one? Is it this one here? Yes, it, it's the last one. The one we didn't check, the very last one. So you can see that one there has the, um, the blue seal on the inside. Hard to even see that. I'm waiting for it to update for me on my screen. The lag time. But that there has a blue seal and there's no ridge. So that one is able to um, compress onto a sealed end. Oh, nope. So that's going to go in this one. And the bottom can be solid now. Since I don't have to worry about that. Which is nice. It solves a lot of my problems. Oh, that still popped. It still pops. I'll work on that. But anyway, now we can actually seal these on here. And this is not tight because we're missing the one. Wait, is that the one? Yeah, so that one can go on this one. At first, I thought air was getting trapped inside there. I was like, what is going on? Why won't these caps fit properly? And then I realized it was because, oh, this one here, you see I drilled a hole in there, thinking it was there. And it wasn't, of course. It was the, um, it was that little ring on the inside of there. Just for the heck of it, for the purpose of experimentation, I'll remove the ring on one of them. See, first, how difficult it is and how effective it is. Uh, that's not going to work too well. Yeah, I don't think removing that ring is going to be easy. Yeah, forget that. Well, the um, the dumping of sand is going to happen if this breaks. Um, so you do have to prevent it from breaking. Um, but yeah, so there's the full five pound configuration. Well, five pounds if they're all full. And then what I'll do is, this is not the right one. I have the, I have the sixth one printing now. Um, but you'll also have an empty one of these. Um, empty one will allow you to do um, two pounds and four pounds. So the one pound will be just a bottle. That'll be one pound. And um, when you're ready to do two pounds, what you'll do is you'll put 
um, one here and one here, opposing corners, with the center being an empty one. So these two outside ones will have sand in it, and the center one will be empty, and that'll give you two pounds. To do three pounds, you replace the center empty one with a full one. And replacing it with a full one, now you have three pounds. You go back to an empty one in the middle and four on the outside with sand, and now you have four pounds. And then do all five full, now you have five pounds. Now, uh, it's not really as much of a pain in the butt as you think because they're, they're not going to be swapping these back and forth. That's not how it works. Um, these people are going to be progressing. So they'll be starting with the one pound, and then when the physical therapist says, okay, you're ready to go to two pounds or three pounds, they'll adjust it for that configuration, and they'll stay in that configuration until they're ready to move up to the next weight. But the idea is that um, all you need is this. So that's it. I might even, um, trying to figure out a way to have it all go together. I wonder if I could put another hole here so that you can store the empty one in this locked configuration when it's not in use so that you could put this all away as one piece because um, right now there's no place to put the fifth one. The question is, will the fifth one fit inside there if I put a hole on both ends? Obviously, you won't be able to use it like that because you won't be able to get your hand in there. But um, that's okay, just for storage. I'm wondering if that might work. But yeah, so I'm going to model up a cap. There's plenty of there's plenty of soda bottle caps already modeled up on Thingiverse. I'll just take one of those, and I'll take the threaded section and extend it. You just copy it, and then you move it down until it perfectly lines up with the previous thread, and you're good. Um, I might also increase the area that's threaded on the um, on the bottles here. So like this here is sized for a soda cap. But now that I'm not doing soda cap, I could, for example, extend those threads one further. So by extending the threads a little bit, I increase the amount of bite that the screws have. And that'll make them more durable, less likely to crack, less likely to break, less likely to slip off. Um, but yeah, that, that'll work nice. I like that. I mean, I kind of I dig the novel idea of using actual soda bottle caps. But um, I also don't like the idea that I'm using a non-printed part now. And I would much prefer to use a you know, fully printed solution because I like fully printed solutions. Um, but yeah, I like that. I think it's nice. I wonder what I want that weighs. That probably weighs half a pound all on its own. Hey, Matt. Because they, the, the, while the bottles themselves are pretty light, they're like 42 grams a piece or something like that. Actually, let's find out. Let's find out what the caps weigh, the bottles weigh. Come on. I guess I should plug it in so it'll work in high performance mode instead of low performance mode. Uh, let's see. Let's not do an update right now. Recent projects. One pound dumbbell. It is. Nope, that's the wrong part. We need one pound stick. Okay. One modification. First layer is 0 0.6. And the bottom layer is just 4. The project has one pound stick. There we go. And that is 291 on 1,000 cubic millimeters, which is a little bit shy of one pound. I think one pound is 300,000 cubic millimeters. But once you add the mass of the um, rest of the parts, it's, it's close enough. I'm not worried about it. 
So this comes out to, where's my math? Here we go, 32 grams. I am totally okay with 32 grams of plastic. So this, uh, each of these uses 32 grams of plastic. Um, then on the load project, recent, 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 there we go. And the wishbone. That's not as bad as I thought. It's not 186 grams each. It's 186 grams total. So both halves together are 186 grams. 187 grams. So that's actually not bad. I think I'd be okay with that. I, I would still love to get that down below 100 grams, but I don't think I need to. Let's see how much that comes out to. 187. Oh, wait a minute. Let's do 32 times 6. 192 plus 186, 378. So you're looking at about, when you, you're, going, you're also going to have to print the 12 caps now. You're looking at about 400 grams of plastic. Um, well, remember, most of the weight is coming from the, um, the sand inside the parts. Um, each of these has a volume of 291,000 cubic millimeters, and that's about um, a third of a liter, which is about a pound. Um, although the, that does add up a bit, the, you know, 400 grams, that means this is almost a pound by itself. So this empty would be just about a pound. Um... Um, so it would be nice to lighten it up if I could, but eh, I think we're close enough. This is this is not you know a scientific experiment. We don't have to be precise. As long as we're close and we have progressions, we're okay. Um, yeah, I like that, and, and I'm I'm liking the design. It's a little bit of a tight fit for me because you know, my my knuckles hit these bottles up top here. It doesn't hurt or anything, but. You know, my knuckles hit those bottles up top there. Um, not a big deal. Um, most people aren't going to touch because most people don't have gigantic hands like I do. Um, I might still try to make the center one a little bit smaller to make that handle a little easier to grab. Um, right now I am um, um, 45 millimeter diameter. And, um, you know, my hand just about wraps around that. But I have gigantic hands. So what I'm going to have to do is have, um, I'm going to have to take this over to the therapy center and just have them, you know, have some people hold on to it and see what they think of the size and whether that's too big, but they need a skinnier handle. Because I could just, what I could do is for the one pounder, I could, um, Instead of holding just a bottle, you put the two caps on. That'll add 200 grams to the mass. So if I make the center one a little skinnier, it plus the end cap should equal a pound. There you go. <laughs> um, well, what I could do is make the center one skinnier. It's not going to hold as much sand. But then if you do it with the... Um, but you can always just hold one of these larger ones when you're doing one pound. Um, so I might make the, the setter handle here skittier to make it easier to grip. <coughs> make it an easier grip for people. Because once you start adding the center handle, you're going to have the mass of the two end caps. So you should still come out pretty close to the um, Two pounds, three pounds, four pounds, five pounds when you factor in the mass of this. But yeah, the durability of the end caps was key. You saw how much I was able to bend that. So we're good on the durability. My only concern is that um, um, if you shock this, if it cracks the bottle here. Now, 
this is not just an empty hole. The hole in here is actually shaped to the bottle. So it's actually form fit to the bottle. I basically, I use the bottle as a cut tool. So that, that hole in there is exactly the right, that, that conical shape inside the hole here is the same conical degree angle as the bottle itself. Um, now at the bottom, it, um, the hole gets a little bit bigger because it has to fit the threads. So I had to, um, threads were 27.4 millimeters diameter. So I made that bottom hole 28 millimeters because the bottle has to be able to come out. Um, if I made it exact, the bottle wouldn't fit. Now, I th at first I thought I had a great idea. I was like, well, what if these thread into the end caps? I was like, you can't do that. <laughs> um, the only way to, because what would happen is you would thread one in, and then how would you thread it to the other side? You can't. You'd have to rotate this somehow. The only way you could do that would be to have inverted threads, and you'd have to thread them all simultaneously. Yeah, that's not happening. Well, that's the thing, though. Um, that's the one part you don't want to print TPU if you can help it, because that's the part that uses the most filament. These only use 32 grams each. All six of these together is still lighter than this frame. Um, but um, the, the, the trick for me is, can I make it shock resistant enough? Yes, but then you'd have to thread all five of them simultaneously. Good luck doing that. <laughs> um, but um, I think by having the open infill structure here, that's going to act as a shock absorber. And um, PETG is more flexible than PLA. It gives instead of cracking. Um, it being a one millimeter thick extrusion, it being the correct conical shape so that this is an actual mating surface, not just a hole it's sitting in. And then once you tighten this down so that this doesn't jiggle anymore like this, you'll be distributing the shock load over 10 joints. So I think it's going to be strong enough. The way I'm going to test it is um, tonight I will print new caps to be able to tighten this down. I will fill these with sand, and I have to print one more of these because I destroyed that one by trying to trim it. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this with sand, and I'm going to drop it on the kitchen floor. I'm just going to knock it off the counter and see what happens to it. And if it survives, I'm going to do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again, and see how many times I can drop it before something breaks. And uh, I don't think this will ever break. I think this frame is basically indestructible for the context in which this is going to exist. I mean, obviously, if you wanted to break it, you could. Um, the question is, will, will it break here? Will it, will it break somewhere here from that shock when it hits? I don't know. Uh, that's part of why I have the frame large enough so that the bulbous ends don't have to hit the ground. I don't have to absorb all the shock. Although, that's probably the strongest part of the model because this will flex. And I can I can flex that. See how much I can squeeze that. I'm pushing in on there and it's not breaking. It's just flexing. So that's very flexible and the sand will also help with that. Yeah, no, that, that's why I made the um, the end cap the correct shape. I'll show you. That's not sustainable. Reusing old filament is not a sustainable practice. We have not technologically reached a point. Well, we haven't. Better not be messing up my print. I'll kick your butt. You hear me? Yeah, come here. Uh, you're a good boy. You're such a good boy. Um, so this conical shape in here, is actually the correct shape for the bottle. I use the bottle to make that shape. So once you tighten these down, that should fit pretty nicely on there. If I can trick the cat into coming closer, I'm gonna snatch him so you guys can see him. Really? Really? You just came up here to knock the bottle on the floor. <laughs> the only reason he came up here was to knock the bottle on the floor so he could play with the bottle. <laughs> you little stinker. 
<laughs> You're a good boy. <laughs> His sole purpose in jumping up here was to knock the empty bottle on the floor so he could screw in it. Cats. <laughs> um, so I am hoping that that correct mating surface cinched down with the sand inside, which is going to act as a shock absorber as well. Um, I'm hoping that'll be strong enough. Uh, I'll have to test it in a couple different configurations. Uh, oh my god. Because um, the best use of the TPU would be to print the bottles in the TPU. The problem is the worst use of the TPU would be printing the bottles in the TPU. Because if you print the bottle in TPU, the bottle will be very flexible. But it will also... Um, Mean that the threads are flexible, which means you tighten and the threads will squeeze. Instead of um, tightening, it'll just crush the threads and it'll pop off. So that is an issue with using TPU as well. Plus, TPU is twice as expensive and requires drying half the time. So my objective is to keep it PETG. I'm sure someone will have already said this, but couldn't you not just build the handle to fit an existing bottle? Save having to print the bottle. Ah, uh, no, because there's no bottles that are double-ended. So I need to I need to enclose it from both ends in order to have that multi-pack configuration. And there's there's no bottle that's um double-ended. All bottles are single-sided. So, how would I attach to here? You know what I mean? You just need one bottle, sure. I mean, that, that's, what actually get, that's what actually gave me this idea. I didn't have any dumbbells. I didn't have the money to buy dumbbells, so I was just taking water bottles, and I was curling those, you know, figuring that's close enough, right? You know, how many milliliters is that? It's actually over a pound, I think. Yeah, it's 500 milliliters. So, that's like, um, 1.6 pounds. Um, so, I was just, um, no, oh, that is um, that is one pound. Three hundred milliliters of sand is a pound. Five hundred milliliters of water is a pound. So that's about a pound right there. And I was like, can I do something with that idea of using a bottle? Um, but several problems. Even the skinniest water bottle I have, which would be the Aquafina bottle, um, that is thick. And the the problem is um, this is not really for healthy people like me. Well, I'm not exactly healthy, but I'm reasonably healthy. I don't have a problem picking up a bottle. A um, person like me can grab a bottle. That's no problem. If I want to if I want to lift eight pounds, just take two milk jugs. And there you go. That's eight pounds each. Um, the idea is to make this for dexterity challenged people. So people who have difficulty with dexterity and movement. People who were, suffered strokes and stuff like that, and older people who just don't have arthritis and stuff like that. So, um, um, the, um, I have to make it small enough that they can wrap their hands around it. So, this is the right size to almost hold a pound. I hope, I think it's small enough that people with dexterity issues will still be able to hold it. And, um, of course, because it's threaded on both ends, I could put an end cap on both ends. That's why mine has a cap on both ends. Because I need to be able to do this. And you, can, you can't do that with one end cap. It's, the whole thing's going to be unstable. Um, theoretically, I can make one of these that holds five bottles of water. But now the person has to be able to grip that bottle of water. And now this piece here has to be substantially larger since it's going to have to sit on top of this part of the bottle here. And then somehow that cap still be strong enough to hold that on there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've used um, you know, water bottles recently, but you notice there's a pretty substantial difference in the caps. And that's because in the, 
the never-ending battle for profit maximization, they have reduced the amount of plastic that this um, requires to the absolute minimum. So these caps are almost non-existent. In fact, one of the problems we have in reusing these bottles to, for our juice bottles to drink out of is that half the time it doesn't thread correctly. It's off by just a hair on... Oh, Noel got down. I heard noise. I thought the print failed. It was actually Noel jumping from the window down to the printer. Um, the threads won't quite go right, and you'll shake it, and you'll get juice everywhere. <laughs> and you'll have to go back it off, and you'll hear it click into the right thread and then tighten it down. So they've minimized these caps to the point. Yeah, they're a pain in the ass. And as you can see, there's no real mating surface here. There's nothing there. There's nothing. There's no lip at all. They've, they've gotten these bottles down to the minimum. Um, it's amazing when you grab an older water bottle and a newer water bottle, and the even these two here, the, the durability difference between these two, these are actually a different generation of bottle. They actually made the bottle thinner going from this one to this one. Um, so, yeah, that's not going to work. It needs to be the full size because the full size is designed for a 2-liter bottle, so it has a strength requirement. Um... And figuring out how to mate um, this bottle to this somehow and have it hang on. I'd have to print my own cap because it would have to sit like that and the cap would have to be a big washer to hold that on there like that. Well, first of all, now this has to be bigger because as you can see, we have less space here because the bottle is bigger. It's a larger diameter. And now you've got more stress because you're... You're, you're holding on to a larger bottle, which is going to be more difficult for them to hang on to. And you're praying. Exactly. Maximizing corporate profits. That's what it is. And there's nothing wrong with that in reality. Um, but now I have to print a maximized cap to go on here. And that cap is hanging on to those little itty bitty threads. And you're hoping that doesn't come off. And now you're torquing it from one end? Yeah, nah. Actually, that's about the right conical shape for that bottle. And then you have one last problem. All the water bottles are different. Every single one of them is different. I mean, look, even these are different. Look, this one's different from this one. These are, these are both Aquafina bottles. The caps are different, and the bottles are different. So all the water bottles are different. There's no consistency because the industry is still in flux. Actually, I think this uses regular caps. Yes. I think this might, yeah, this still uses regular soda bottle caps. So this is one of the older water bottles that they haven't switched over to these new super minimized caps. This actually still uses a soda bottle cap, but even this cap is weaker than you know, a proper soda bottle cap. Um, uh, nothing yet. I'm just, I'm going to be printing parts and I'm going to, um, hopefully have as many parts as I can to bring to, um, Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Fest to show people, you know, just to show off, you know, a small section of what I'm building. Um, so, um, real quick, finish that. So the whole entire industry is still in flux. They're still figuring out a final design for water bottles. And this is getting pretty close. This cap is probably pretty close to final. It's about the minimum cap that's actually going to work. And um, mostly because it's one-time use. Um, so once the industry settles down, they'll probably finalize on a shape and a cap maybe 10 years from now. They'll probably all be the same size and shape. But until then, that doesn't work. So I need to make my own bottle that's always the exact same shape every time. Yes, yeah, 16.9 ounces. That's why the on-the-go juice packs are designed for the 16.9 ounces of water. So we buy lots of these, and we just dump them in the bottle. I have a little distiller, and we refill those bottles um, from the water buffalo, and then we just dump the juice packs in them, and that's, that's our water. Um, so this one here, you can see I already took off. The end so this can actually be capped on both ends. So one of these will be um, 
empty so that you can have all the variations of weight because it only costs 32 grams of plastic to print one more um and, um once i print my own cap i'll be able to make this thread down nice and tight so that it will engage this and have less wobble less play you see it's almost there now it's almost deep enough to grab that um, but i can't reduce the number of threads because then it'll just pop off yeah, i'm liking it. It, it i think it's gonna work i think it's gonna be pretty nice i might design a um i might differentiate the empty handle with um by making it thinner and this way you'll also have the option so if the person you're giving it to does have a serious dexterity problem you can swap out the thinner handle for that person so it's easier for them to grab because um, i don't know what the the correct diameter for this should be i'm making the diameter what it needs to be to hold roughly one pound of sand but there might actually be a correct diameter to use so that people with dexterity issues can grip onto this properly. Um, so I'll have to look into that. Um, so the, the first, well, I've decided to go with a metal shed for the fuel. I can get a little four by three foot metal shed for like a hundred bucks. They're cheap, they're garbage, but they're metal. And I, I think it would be safer to store fuel in a metal shed. So if it catches on fire, the whole entire shed doesn't become a fuel source. Because as much as we love 3D printing, let us not forget, this, these are flammable. Um, they will burn. <laughs> um, but the big one is going to go up front. I'm going to make it a long, skinny one. Um, if I could print enough parts, I'm hoping to um, eventually, you know, a year and a half from now, I'm hoping it'll be 20 feet long. So maybe eight foot by twenty, where I can get away with, um, because then it'll act as a wind block. Um, it'll stop the wind from coming through my carport like a tornado. And um, I'm think I think I've finalized on just using two by fours and corrugated, you know, um, greenhouse plastic for the roof, just to keep that part simple. So the the top blocks, each one will have a slot designed to hold a 2x4, and there'll be a bolt hole that can go through there. So you put the piece of 2x4 in, put the bolt through it, and you're done. You're screwed through it. And that'll hold it down. And then um, what you'll do is you'll put an eye bolt in a couple of the 2x4s, and you'll run hurricane straps down to the, um, to the ground. you don't want the shed to blow away so that'll be your not only will that give you a firm mounting in the 2x4 but the 2x4 and the ground anchor will act as a compression and will squeeze the whole building together so it can't wiggle around um let's see uh last week the road rudder festival people they <coughs> they had um Um, portobello mushrooms so i got like four pounds of portobello mushrooms that was wonderful let me tell you a couple of nights i made up some um some meatballs some brown gravy portobello mushrooms onion and then a side dish either rice or pasta or something like that oh my god that was good <laughs> just uh last night uh not last night night before we had an entire plate full of um cauliflower broccoli carrots and corn and then the meatballs and the brown gravy with the portobello mushrooms. It was so good. <laughs> oh, that was delicious. And we got these big, giant, beautiful white onions. Eggs are starting to go back down in price a little bit. We're down to $12 for five dozen. Still too expensive, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, let's see, any good... Oh, Walmart finally got the triple chocolate back. Um, Walmart has their own brand, you know, Great Value is their own brand of stuff. And they have their own K-Cups for making coffee. 
and they're, they're actually pretty good. They're, they're actually not the cheapest. I mean, for me, a good deal is 30 bucks for 100 um, That's a good deal for K-Cups. Um, but they have their own brand. It's um, 4 43 for a dozen. So they're not exactly super cheap. You're looking at, what, 30 cents a piece? I think that is. Which is, actually, I guess that's not bad. But 4.43, I think it was. Divided by 12. That's 37 cents a cup. So it's a little on the higher side, but not bad. Um, but they have caramel cream, um, caramel pecan, which I love. Um, they also have... Um, They have like three, I mean, they have toasted coconut, which is pretty good. Um, yeah. <laughs> Why would I give chickens the heart? Fuck that, I'm eating hearts. <laughs> that black death heart, yeah, that's going in my gullet. But, um, the, um, they had a flavor that they released for like one week. You know, we were able to get one box, and then they stopped selling it. And I was getting ready to just drop a nuke on Walmart HQ. Um, Misfits Market, where they sell you the, um, the less-than-perfect vegetables at hyperinflated expensive prices. Yeah, not a good deal. I mean, I, I guess if you're comparing them to Whole Foods, they're a good deal. But if you're comparing them to what Walmart and Kroger's and Smith's has on the shelf, it's not a good deal. Um, that's the, that kind of thing is more for um, people who are well-off, who are more well-off and want to feel good. You know, like, like buying a Prius to save gas. You know, if, if, you're a, if you're a delivery driver, okay, buying a Prius makes sense. But if you're a regular person, you're not really saving much buying a Prius. To be honest, you're not really saving much buying an electric car either. Um, you know, it's more people who just drive an inordinate number of miles who actually save money. Just the cars are just too expensive still. Cars have to come down in price. I looked into chickens because I'd love to have chickens. I really would. And I could build my own chicken coop by printing it. Because chicken coops are actually expensive. So it's definitely cheaper to print your own chicken coop. <laughs> um... Especially since a lot of it's open air, so you need a lot less printed parts. But um, chickens are actually expensive. There's a reason those eggs sell for 5 and $6 a dozen. Because they need to, to feed those chickens. When you add the cost of buying all the hay and buying all the feed and stuff like that for chickens, it's a lot of money. Now, chickens make sense if you have a lot of waste products that you can use to feed them. So if you have a big, giant, you know, farmhouse family of seven, ten people, and so the waste from you making dinner is more than enough to feed the chickens, okay, chickens are wonderful, especially when you factor in the free eggs you're going to get from that. Um, but if you're, if you're like me and Michelle, where you're two people, our waste is nowhere near enough to feed the chickens. I mean, I... I, uh, I actually pay 16 cents more for my broccoli to get the florets, which has no waste because the stems are always nasty. But um, we, have no, we have very little food waste, you know, stuff that could be fed to chickens. And, um, which means, and we also don't have an insect-rich environment. We live in the desert. So um, some people actually, um, what do you call it? They call it when you grow something on purpose. Um, I forgot the goddamn word for it. We, where basically, you farm bugs. There are some people who farm bugs. They actually have their own little bug farm so that they can feed the chickens. I'll cultivate. Yes, that's it. That's the word. Thank you. Thank you, James White. Um, they cultivate an insect farm so they can feed their chickens. And... Um, so if you live in an environment where you can do that, like for example, if you live in the, um, you know, if you live on the eastern, you know, food belt where you get nice grass and you know and stuff like that, and you get all the humidity and the rain, and 
you can grow everything you need to feed the chickens. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, I live in the desert. So I'd be making weekly trips to tractor supply to buy what I need to keep the chickens alive. And the question is, um, do the eggs equal more value than the dollars you spent buying all the chicken feed? The answer is no. The chicken feed is going to cost more than going to Walmart and buying the eggs. I can go to Walmart and buy five dozen eggs for $12. Um, that means you're going to need at least, if you get an egg a day, um, you're going to need six chickens. Now, six chickens is not bad. Six hens plus a rooster, so seven birds. Um, you're going to need seven birds in order to approximate 30 eggs a week. Um, although, we don't eat 30 eggs a week. We eat 30 eggs every two weeks. So we could probably get by with three or four birds. Um, so three or four birds, and then we can have a... Um, I thought you needed a rooster for the hens. Huh. I thought you needed that. Interesting. So three hens would probably be enough. Yeah, it's going to give you about 15 to 18 eggs a week if under optimal conditions. And, um, well, our winters are mild enough that chickens keep producing in the winter. Okay. Um, around here, they slow down production in the wintertime, but they still keep producing. And remember, you have to raise those chickens before they'll produce eggs. So you're feeding them and you're getting nothing if you're raising them. And then eventually they're going to age out. They're going to run out of eggs. So you're going to turn them into dinner and then get new chicks and start the whole process over again. So yes, if you have a farm, a large family, fertile ground, all of that makes sense. But for us, it's questionable. The um, thing is, the hay for their bedding and the feed to keep them alive and producing eggs, is that going to be more than $6 a week? If it's more than $6 a week, you're better off just going to Walmart and buying the eggs. Um, now, you could, if you overproduce eggs, you could sell some eggs. Um, yeah, that's what we're assuming. We're assuming an egg a day, roughly. We're assuming that, for example, um, three hens will give you 15 to 18 eggs a week. Probably more like 10 to 12 eggs a week. But um, close enough. So four birds would probably produce the 18 um, eggs a week that we would eat, roughly. Um, now, when we're doing better, when we're not so financially burdened, um, when we have a little, you know, excess financial wiggle room, I'm actually still thinking about getting some chickens. Um, not because it's a cost-effective way to get eggs, but because I think it would be a fun hobby. Um, um, the chickens can actually make pretty good pets. And um, although we do have to protect them here, we have birds, we have coyotes, we have skunks, we have raccoons, we have, a, we have snakes. We have a lot of critters around here that would very much love to make dinner out of your chickens. Um, ah. Interesting. And that would be easy to solar power, too. Um, so, um, and also once we're in better physical shape, because we have to be physically in well enough shape to be able to take care of the chickens, um, you know, to be able to go outside, go down the stairs, walk out there, do it, come back in. Right now, Michelle could not do that. Um, so, um... <laughs> But yeah, down the road, it might be nice just because I think it would be enjoyable. I mean, just being able to go outside and sit with the chickens. I think it would be pleasant, but it would not be equitable. It would be a hobby. You'd be spending money on the hobby. You're, you're not going to make back your money in eggs in almost most cases. In the, in the small setting like we have here, you're very likely going to spend more money taking care of the chickens than you are going to save in not having to buy eggs. 
And contrary to popular belief, and call me a heathen for saying this, I cannot taste any difference between farm fresh eggs and store-bought eggs. I tried. I actually saved all of my egg cartons because I know there's a lot of people with chickens around here and they appreciate having the um, egg cartons, especially the paper ones. So I actually save all of my egg cartons. And when I have a big enough stack that it's worth somebody to drive out here, um, I offer them up. I say, they're free. Come get them. You know, I just I save them until there's enough to make it worth your trip. And um, half the time, they'll leave me a dozen eggs as a payment for all the egg cartons. And they're beautiful. I love all the different colors. You know, all the different browns and blues and yellows. And you know, the, It's very pretty. You open up that egg box and it's like, wow, that's, that's gorgeous. It's very pretty. And, um... And they do look a little different when you put them in a pan. Like, you can tell the yolk and the whites are a little bit different. The yolks look a little richer. But actually tasting them, I could never tell the difference. Like, not even slightly. Not even an imaginary difference. <laughs> there's, just, there's just no... There's no difference. I can't taste it. And, um, yeah, me neither. I don't have a super refined palate. But um, now maybe if maybe it's because we're in the desert, maybe they're not coming out as tasty as eggs in a more fertile ground where they have a more varied diet. Um, I know there's a big thing around here last year. Um, something changed with the particular brand of feed at Tractor Supply, and the chicken stopped laying. And eventually, somebody figured out it was the feed. Something in the feed was stopping the chickens from laying eggs. This is right at the end of COVID. All the conspiracy theorists are going crazy about that. And um, um, they switched brands and the chickens started laying again. Um, so there was a big thing in next door, a big group of people talking about avoid this brand, don't buy this. And it was all it was crazy. <laughs> and, um, but, um, but yeah, chickens would be nice as a hobby, but it's it's on a tiny scale like this, it's not really equitable. And chickens are also not equi equitable for eating. Um, chickens are cheap. Chicken meat does not cost a lot of money. It's three or four dollars a pound for boneless, skinless thighs or breasts. So chicken does not cost much. And um, I was actually looking at when before my electric car stopped working correctly, where I can't drive into Albuquerque anymore. I was actually looking for somebody who would um, butcher them for me. I really don't want to do that. I've done it. I've butchered a chicken. Um, it's, that, it's not that hard. Kind of just twist its head till it comes off and everything comes out. Um, the, um, oh, yeah, I've heard of the, the Chinese dog food that I had poison in it. <laughs> Whew. But um, I've done it before. It was a long time ago. It was... You know, 30 years ago, I butchered a chicken. Uh, I, I, theoretically, I know how to do it, and I could probably look up how to do it, but I don't want to. I just don't want to. I, I want to take the meat out of the freezer, put it in the defroster, and cook it. I don't want to butcher a chicken. Um, I mean, I would do it if I had to, but I, I did not consider it an enjoyable experience. Um, when, we, when we killed the chickens, the, the group next to me didn't kill the chicken and the thing was screaming like crazy and I had to go over and finish the damn thing off to stop it from suffering. So um that was not an enjoyable experience for me. So I understand where our food comes from. I understand how all that works. I just prefer buying a package in the grocery store. I don't want to have to kill the animal myself. Um So what I was hoping to find was somebody who would butcher chickens for me and do a one-for-one one deal. I bring you two chickens, you butcher both of them, give me one. And um, because I see roosters all the time available for free, that's one of roosters and sometimes even hens, but mostly roosters, um, that's one of the few things that's actually available for free around here. And you, that They actually pop up pretty frequently on um, Craigslist and, and the Facebook Marketplace. So I was wondering, you know, I guess I'll be starving soon. Um, well, you know, we, we are overweight. 
sickly and in poor health. So um, if the zombie apocalypse occurs, we'll be one of the first to be eaten. So, you know, I'll be coming for you. Hey! <laughs> um, but the reality is, I've got enough food to feed us for two years. So, I won't be starving. <laughs> I could cut my food budget in half. So, if food prices doubled, and I had to start buying half the amount of food in order to keep my food budget the same dollar amount, uh, we're good for like four and a half, five years. Yeah, I'm, that, that's one thing I don't screw around with. I, I have plenty of food. Um, but I was hoping that I could, um, you know, start scarfing up these free chickens. You know, a free chicken is not really worth spending, you know, 50 miles of gasoline to go get. But when it's an electric car that's solar charged, so my cost is zero, um, it's worth going to grab them. But I never did find anybody who does that around here. Most of the people around here are retired, and there's not, there's not much in the way of butchers around here. Um, but that was an idea I had. And, uh, just because I, I thought it would be fun. But, um... You gotta remember, I chose one of the worst places to live in a shit hits the fan scenario because there I can't live off the land. It's desert. I'm in the middle of a fucking desert. <laughs> Without grocery stores, everybody around here dies fast. <laughs> um, but that's the cost you pay for lower property taxes, lower purchase price for the house. Less humidity, lower maintenance, more comfort, lower electricity demands. Yeah, it's a high desert. All that means is that you freeze in the wintertime. That's all that means. <laughs> our, our high desert, that just means you freeze in the wintertime. You know, um, from a comfort standpoint, I should have gotten a place down Rio Rancho, you know, 2,000 feet lower at Albuquerque's level. Where they don't really see really cold winter. Um, basically, the winter that we got this winter is what Albuquerque normally gets. We got extraordinarily lucky this year. Um, after that asshole stole all my fuel, I was genuinely concerned about what was going to happen if we got a cold snap. Because the one heat pump I have is not enough to cool this house or heat this house if it gets really cold. And, um, I simply could not, I mean, I theoretically, I have enough electric heaters to plug in and turn on. I can't afford to run them. Each one of those heaters. Oh, uh, well, no, Rio Rancho, um, I don't know. I have no idea who, but someone stole all my fuel. All my kerosene, all my diesel, all my propane. Took it all. All the tanks, all the containers, everything. I was backing up out of the driveway one morning, and I looked over, and I was like, where's my tanks? And I noticed all my tanks were gone. That's like 50 gallons of um, diesel and kerosene and, you know, enough to get us through like a month, um, you know, if it got really cold. And, um, and then I was like, yeah, I looked over at the trailer. All the propane tanks were gone. Yep. Some fucking asshole came onto my property and um, stole all my fuel and all my propane. So I got to beef up my, it's partially my fault. Uh, I normally keep the fuel out back. I had brought the fuel out front because I was getting ready to set up the fuel tank out front for, um, you know, refueling the heater inside the house. And um, so I, I had my big, you know, trolley cart. And I put all the fuel on it and I brought it around front. And I just hadn't gotten to doing it yet. And I guess it was long enough that someone saw an opportunity and, oh. What are you going to do? Um, people are dirtbags. All I can hope is that they have a gasoline-powered car and they put that fuel in their car. I really, really, really hope they had a gasoline-powered car and they dumped that fuel in their car. That would give me just a tiny bit of pleasure. Not much, but a tiny bit of pleasure. So yeah, that was about $1,000 of fuel and tanks that I cannot replace. 
even now, propane tanks are going for double what I paid for those tanks. Probably why he stole them. Uh, for some reason, the price of propane tanks has almost doubled in the last year. So, um, I, even if I wanted to replace those propane tanks, which I can't, um, they're now worth twice what they were before. <laughs> so that tank I paid 80 bucks for, yeah, that's selling for like 160, 200 bucks now. Nice! And they were full. Yep, they were full of propane. Because I have a, I have a little, as a, as a backup, backup, backup heater, I have a little 5,000 BT propane heater, indoor safe. It's a small enough burn volume that it won't, um, carbon monoxide you out of your house. One of those little buddy heaters. And, you know, I have a, I had a couple 40 pound tanks, the, the big ones, the big RV size tanks, the nice ones, you know, go whole summer without having to refuel it. So those little fucking 20 pound tanks and, um, hook one of those up and then run that heater for a week. Yeah. So I'm going to have to beef up my security. Last week I caught a guy. Well, I didn't catch him. My camera caught him. I caught a guy walking around my house. Um, he walked in front of every camera except the normal one that he should have walked in front of, the one front door. It's the only one he didn't walk in front of. You know he was up to no good. You know, hoodie pulled up, gloves on. Yeah, he was up to no good. Didn't take anything. At least I can't see anything he took. Um, I posted it to next door, and they say he's probably looking for tools and metal. A scrapper. Stuff that he can convert to cash quick. You, know, you, you steal something like this, you know, you, you can't really convert that to cash. What are you going to do? Sell it for a dollar? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows you stole it. They're going to give you a buck for it. So you can't really convert that to cash. You know, they're looking for raw metal and tools and stuff like that. And I don't leave that kind of stuff out. Um, what you got to do? I catch them, I'll eat them. So hopefully posting the next door, um, you know, getting all the neighbors riled up about it. Hopefully he'll catch wind of it and stay away. Now that he realizes I have cameras. Um, New Mexico has an equal force wall. What does that mean? Someone comes onto my property, I don't care what the law says, they're getting Mr. 12 Gauge to the face. If the law disagrees with that, the law can lick my balls. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> Good luck getting a jury to convict on that. You know, the police are going to show up. I'm going to shoot the guy in the front, not the back. You never shoot somebody in the back. That's just, um, what do you call that? That's just, pussies shoot people in the back. You never shoot somebody in the back, ever. But, um, you know, I'm going to shoot him in his face, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, leave his body with a knife next to it sitting there for the police to collect i'm not going to touch it so you know a knife is considered lethal force and i responded with lethal force i don't see the problem there if he pulls a knife that's lethal force shooting him is equal force And New Mexico does have a castle doctrine, and it does not have a retreat requirement. At least not from your home. From your home, it is a no-retreat state. I'm pretty sure that changed, that New Mexico is a no-retreat state from your home. Elsewhere, there might be a requirement to retreat, but not from your home. New Mexico State Supreme Court has held there is no duty to retreat 
before using force in public. So New Mexico has no duty to retreat. It wasn't by law, it was by Supreme Court decision. State Supreme Court. So I have no duty to retreat. You threaten my life on my property, I'm ending your life. Now, if he's unarmed, I'm not going to shoot him. I'm not going to shoot a guy who's unarmed, unless he charges me. But uh, I'm just going to hold him there until the police get there. But if he, he got a weapon, dead. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not going to engage in a battle of fisticuffs with you. you know? uh, I'm nearly 50 years old. I'm over 400 pounds. If I tried to walk 100 feet, I'd be dead on my feet out of breath. You know, I, I'm not going to challenge you to fisticuffs, fisticuffs or challenge you physically. I'm just going to pull out my roommate, Mr. 12 Gauge, and you guys are going to dance. <laughs> this is, it's that simple. So, uh, New Mexico is... Um, New Mexico is constitutional carry in your home, but not on your person. You have to um, get a permit to carry on your person. However, your car is considered an extension of your home in New Mexico. So concealed carry in your car is constitutionally protected. In New Mexico, you can conceal carry on your property and you can conceal carry in your car. When you get out of your car, you have to have a permit if you want to conceal carry. So New Mexico is not too bad for that. What, what case was that, by the way? I'm wondering when that was decided. Ouch. That's got to be rough. Was it justified or you know, in Santa Fe? Well, why did she? Well, so the problem was she pled out. And that's Part of how um, demonic our legal system is in the United States is that um, a lot of our cases never make it to court. They plea out, and that's because we don't have representation. Can't afford to hire a good lawyer. You're basically screwed. And so a lot of people end up pleading out, even though they're innocent. And um, cases like that can suck. There is no equal force law. Uh, um, this must maybe this is before the Supreme Court decision, but New Mexico by Supreme Court, state Supreme Court, you have no duty to retreat. Either the law was misapplied, um, or um, this predated that Supreme Court decision. It says here, though New Mexico does not have standard ground statute, the state Supreme Court has held there is no duty to retreat for using force in public. That is, uh, that's old. State versus Horton. 57 New Mexico, 257, 261, 1953. And state versus Anderson. Says State versus Anderson, the jury was not, however, informed as required by UJI 1451-90 that a person who is threatened with an attack need not retreat. Why can't I select that? There we go. What is your problem?
Well, most places require there to be an actual threat for you to respond. Um, why can't I select this? Why can't I post this? Something's wrong with this text. There must be ASCII code that is messing with this text. Here we go. It won't let me post this. I don't understand why it won't let me post that. Maybe it's too long? Ah, okay. It's too long. Hey, Mike. Still won't let me post it. There it goes. So there's the is the state of our law as of 1953. Although 2015, um, it mentioned the requirement to that they do not have to retreat. Now, most places, um, if I understand what you mean by equal force, um, if someone is stealing gasoline from out in front of my house, I can't walk out my door and shoot them with my shotgun. I'm probably going to, but it's going to be filled with rock salt and not birdshot. You know, it's going to be non-lethal. I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to scare Jesus back into their life, put it that way. <laughs> um, but you can't just shoot and kill somebody because they're stealing some gasoline. I mean, I would like to be able to, but you, you, that's not right. I mean, stealing something is, stealing is one of the worst crimes a person can commit especially when you're stealing from somebody who can't afford it, so even though that doesn't justify it in any way, shape, or form. But a person shouldn't die because they're stealing five gallons of gas. That shouldn't be a death sentence. So that makes sense, um, if that's what you mean by equal force. In order for me to be able to kill somebody, I have to actually be in fear for my own life from death or bodily harm, or somebody else is in, in threat of bodily harm or death. So, like, if you threaten my life or you threaten my sister's life, I'm going to end you. Um, to me, that makes sense. Um, we, live, we live in a civilized society. We shouldn't be allowed to just go around and kill people for committing what are, as, as painful as they are, and we could have had a very, very uncomfortable winter if it was colder because he stole that fuel. Um, as painful as it is, um, it wasn't life-threatening. He wasn't threatening our life by slinking in at 4 o'clock in the morning and stealing my fuel. Um, ending his life because he was stealing my fuel, to me, would not be justified use of force. Um, so I, I believe there should be limits on the amount of force you can use. I believe you should be required to match forth, force with war, force. Uh, I don't even know exactly when they took it, but um, no, I didn't hear them. And remember, the, um, where the fuel was was about 100 feet from the house and about you know, another 75 feet to the street. So I wouldn't be surprised because I, I saw a shadow in the one video of somebody running back and forth. Um, at least I think I did. I'm not sure. Um, could just be light play in the shitty video. That camera is dead. I gotta replace that camera. But um, he probably parked in the street. He was probably in the road, the dirt road, on the other side of my trees where I wouldn't see his car. And he probably ran back and forth with the fuel. So I wouldn't have heard a thing. And I will hire a lawyer and I will win. If they have a knife, I am allowed to shoot them. If the law doesn't agree with that, fuck the law. And I'll tell you, I'll tell every judge and every prosecutor to go fuck themselves every time they authorize a cop's shooting of a citizen because they drew a cell phone or they drew a knife. No, that's bullshit. You draw a knife, you die. I think I will.
Let's see. So be it. The person will still be dead. Now, I don't know about you, but um, this law seems to make it pretty clear on what the justification for lethal force is, deadly force. Now, maybe this has changed. This is a House Bill 228 from 2011, so maybe the um, law has changed. Uh, no, Ben, I'll just be dead. Because if I think they're doing something they're not supposed to do, I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist with extraordinary violence, and I will not stop resisting until unconscious or dead. And when I regain consciousness, I will resume resistance until I am free or dead. So they'll probably just end up killing me. But according to this 2011 legislation, um, it says here that deadly force is authorized. A person is justified in using force against another person when and to the extent the person reasonably believes that such force is necessary, um, subject, subject to subsections C, D, and E, a person is justified in using deadly force against another person only if the person reasonably believes that such force is necessary to defend the person or a third-party person against another person's imminent or actual use of unlawful deadly force or imminent or actual commission of a felony that involves the use of force or a deadly weapon. Now, a knife is a deadly weapon. According to this 2011 law, lethal force would be justified in that situation. So maybe this is new law since you've been here? I don't know. Uh, this law even has protection against civil damages, meaning um, within the limitations outlined here, um, it protects me against being sued by whoever survives the perp I kill. And it even adds this section, no prosecution for defensive action. No person shall be placed in legal jeopardy of any kind for protecting that person or that person's family or personal property or for coming to the aid of another person in imminent peril pursuant to the provisions of 32-7-1978. So this is new 2011 law that seems to beef up... Um, the protections, I can't post it all because it's um, too long, but you can click on that link and read it. So that 2011 House bill seems to make that pretty, um, did it ever actually pass? House Bill 228. HB 228, did it ever pass? New Mexico. I'm assuming it passed. I don't know if it actually did. I don't know if it actually passed. I'll have to find out. Oh, 1976. So that was even before... 
that was even before the 1978 self-defense law. But yeah, that was that was very much a long time ago. But to the best of my understanding, I am allowed to match lethal force with lethal force. If you threaten my life or great bodily harm to me or my family, I am allowed to use deadly force to stop you. And to me, that's reasonable. I mean, a person, a person stealing your stuff and running away, do I want to shoot them to stop them from taking my stuff? Yes. Do I think I should be allowed to? I don't know. I'm on the fence on that. My gut instinct says yes, that's my stuff and I should be able to stop them. But should stealing five gallons of fuel equal a death sentence? I also don't think that's right. So I'm I'm on the fence on that. But if you threaten to harm someone or threaten to kill someone, then well, all bets are off. <laughs> Prepare to meet your maker. <laughs> I mean, you brought it on yourself at that point. <coughs> that sucks, though. It sucks that she was forced to plea out. We do not have, we definitely do not have a very just justice system in this country. Our justice system is designed for punishment and vengeance. And, this, and for profit, for revenue, it's not really designed to get justice. It takes a lot of work and usually a lot of money to actually get justice. That was when I was born. I was born in 1976. Damn. You were married and had a wife when I was being born. Jesus. Yeah, there was, a, there was a news article talking about, what was it, Norway? How some of their prisons are, you know, they, they might as well be, you know, resort hotel vacation spots. Yes and no. Um, you can, if, if they are threatening deadly force against you, you can use deadly force against them. However, if you are, um, if they are just committing a felony, if they're just committing a crime, you know, they're not threatening to kill you, then yes, you are correct. They have, uh, they otherwise have a legal right to be there. That can't be used as justification to elevate the deadly force. That, that makes sense. It actually specifies that in the law. It actually talks about that. That was one of the things that it talked about. And th that actually makes sense. So the way this works in this law is that it's a presumption. Um, a presumption means you automatically get to assume this. Like, the default is we assume you were allowed to. Um, so this exception says that... Um, the person against whose defensive force is used has a right to be in or is a lawful resident or owner of the dwelling place or work or occupied vehicle. Remember, in New Mexico, a vehicle is similar to a house in Mexico law. Um, it's considered one of your dwellings. So, yes, you, you, would, you would lose the presumption that you are right. That doesn't mean you go to jail. That just means you now have to defend your actions. It's not a presumption. A presumption is I don't have to defend it. No, nope. he was robbing me. He had a knife. I shot him. He was on my property. He was trespassing. The presumption is my use of deadly force was allowed, meaning they're not allowed to prosecute me. They would have to overcome that presumption to prosecute me. What this is saying, uh, it looks like it. 2011. It looks like this is saying that you lose that presumptive righteousness if the person was lawfully allowed to be there. So what that means is you now have to defend your actions. You have to, you have to show that you were justified in using deadly force, which makes sense. Otherwise, you'd have roommates killing roommates. <laughs> and um, so that, that makes sense.
It was um, HB0228. I posted a link to it there. Um, but that's sensible law. I, I a nuclear bomb could go off outside of my house, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't wake up. <laughs> yeah, I'm a. Once I actually do fall asleep, I'm a pretty sound sleeper. Uh, fucking cats have woken me up a few times. <laughs> yeah, um, especially Nolsey. He um, when Ender wants to cross over my body. He just walks over my body. In fact, one of the annoying parts is he tends to stand on whatever part of my body he's crossing over, and he just stands there for a bit, and then he continues. And it's like, what are you doing, cat? Move along. <laughs> um, Noel, on the other hand, he jumps. And so he'll be on the right side of me, and he'll jump onto my chest and then jump off the other side. Um, and so when he does that, that gets me awake. <laughs> Wow. Um, I don't know regarding my weight loss yet. I'm still heavier than the scale will measure. So that means I, I haven't lost more than 40 pounds yet. Um, once I lose 40 pounds, I'll be below 460. And then I'll be able to get weighed on a scale. Although I haven't checked the last month. Yeah, um, the next time I go to the doctors, their, their scales go up to 460. I'll check one there. Um... Well, yes, uh, well, several problems that you could have, depending on what state you're in. I'm glad you had a reasonable judge, James. First, you were a professional. So, um, unlike our police force in this country, which is a joke, um, unlike our police force, professionals are held to a higher standard for use of force, typically. And also, um, um, some states do not shield you from civil prosecution. Like, New Mexico has a specific law that shields you from civil prosecution. So if you, are, if you are legally defending yourself, you can't be sued civilly. So the family can't come after you um, if it was legitimate self-defense. Um, some states do not have that protection. So you might win the criminal case and then lose the civil case. That happens a lot, too. Um, but somebody trying to stick you with a knife is, that's pretty much cut and dry. <laughs> so I'm glad you, you had an overzealous prosecutor who had it out for you. Yeah, Texas is pretty good running those laws as well. Although Texas is a little unequal in their application of those laws. So you roll the dice, <laughs> as with any state. You know, the... the the, the white guy defending himself from police um, was acquitted, and the black guy defending himself police is going up on capital charges. <laughs> so the, the, the laws aren't quite equally applied. A lot of the times, the problem you run into is it's not the law that's bad, it's the application of the law that's bad. Meaning, um, unethical enforcement of the law. Well, I'm not going to apply it to you, but I'm going to stick it to you. Because I like you and I don't like you. That happens sadly a lot as well. Um, that's why we need more aggressive laws. Like laws that say you are prevented from being civilly prosecuted and such. But yeah, that, that happens a lot. Um, that's not really a failure of the law. That's a failure of law enforcement. Contrary to popular belief... Police are not law enforcement. Oh, that, that not, that's not just that can happen. That did happen. And that's likely exactly what happened to your first wife, sadly, too. She couldn't afford, I assume she couldn't afford to defend herself, and that's why she pleaded out. But somebody wanted to prosecute her for that. Probably misogynistic. You know, some guy who doesn't like the idea that a woman defends herself. 
Well, yeah, getting shot would tend to motivate you out of that line of work. <laughs> Jesus, dude. Wow. I tell people, I have a shotgun. It's a hundred-year-old shotgun from my great-grandma. I, I have a pistol. It's, it's a 22 8 eight-shot revolver. You know, it's just a pistol, simple pistol. And um, I've never even fired it. Okay? <laughs> um, I, I tell people, if I die without ever having to point a weapon at another human being, I am 100% okay with that. I mean, I do not want to have to go... I don't care how justified... I don't care if the guy is on top of my sister getting ready to murder her. Will I kill him? Yes, I will. But I do not want to have to go to sleep every night after that visualizing a person I killed. doesn't matter how justified it was. Just knowing I killed somebody is not something I want to have to live with. Yeah, I know. Well, I got it at the time where 22 ammo became like unobtainium. <laughs> I still have a pending order for a bucket of 22 from Palmetto, Palmetto Armory in Florida that still hasn't been delivering four years later. <laughs> I've shot plenty of guns before. I've just never shot this gun before. I got it. It was a birthday gift from my father right after, uh, right before he died. And so it just became, you know, sat in its box. You know, life took over after that point, and shooting guns didn't become a priority. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, if I, if I can die without ever having to threaten another human's life, I'm happy with that. And, and probably I will. The likelihood that I will ever have to use deadly force against another human being is so infinitesimally small, it's ridiculous. We live in the safest period of time in all of human history. Violence is at an all-time low in all of human history. You've literally, in the 400,000 years Homo sapiens have existed, you have never been safer than now. It feels more dangerous because the world is smaller. We have news from everywhere. So it feels smaller. Uh, Michelle's doing okay. Although I'm probably going to have to go splash some water on her to get her to feed the cats. <laughs> but um, she's been doing good on the medicine. Um, she just had a, um, an ultrasound and a CT scan and because uh, she's having stomach issues. And so far, it looks like she's okay. No issues. They didn't find anything bad. They still have a couple more things to check, but so far, it's looking okay. Yep. Well, that's the problem is drunk jerks. People who become jerks once they're inebriated. Yeah. That's a, that's a rough job. That's a, that's a rough job. Um, I, I think I told you guys once before. I, 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 I've been in a few you know, dangerous scenarios. Most of the time, it's, it's car accidents. I, I've seen dead bodies. It's not fun. It haunts you. But, you know, you deal with it. You move on. Nothing I was involved in. One was a search and rescue. Um, Ended up finding a deceased party. They weren't alive anymore. Um, many accident scenes just because of how much, you know, I drive. Just, you know, accidents that didn't even involve me. Just, you know, I was there. You know, rendered aid. You, you want nightmare stuff? Yeah, that one. The, um, it was out of our delivery area, a place we don't normally go to. But the, the, the girl who was on the phone, she took the order without you know, doing her due diligence. She was new. She made a mistake. So because we already took the order, because we already made the pizza, I was like, I'll take it. And um, I get there. And um, when I open the hotel room door, when she opens the hotel room door, she steps back. It's that hotel room where you have um, the little hallway. And then on the left, you have a closet. On the right, you have the bathroom. And when you go through that little tiny hallway, then you have the actual room of the hotel room. Um, the, um, she, the only light in the entire room is the light by the door. 
And they even covered up the alarm clock because I didn't see the glowing of the alarm clock, which you always see in those hotel rooms. And they blacked out all the windows. They had all the window curtains closed. The whole entire room was black. And um, um, she opens the door and steps back. And she is standing in the opening and there's a chair there. And she is in um, panties and bra and tries to invite me in. And, you know, I took a half a step and my, the hairs on the back of my head just stood up. And, you know, and my fur, I looked at her and I saw her eyes flick like that. And, and I just went, there's somebody standing behind that wall. I, I knew it with every fiber in my being that there was somebody standing right behind that wall, you know, right, you know, against the wall where the bed is, where the AC controls would be. And, um... I took a step back, and I was like, you can come out here and pay. And she's like, no, just come in and sit down. And uh, I was like, yeah, so, so your, your, your buddy can knock me over the head and rob me? I was like, I'm gone. See ya. <laughs> I hauled ass backpedaling because I didn't want to look away from that door. I was afraid someone was going to come running out of the door and chasing me. No one ever did. But I backpedaled like 50 feet down that hallway and then just hauled ass out there. And, um... I passed the front desk, and I was like, "I was like, okay, you have a problem in that room." They were setting up to mug me. Uh, they were setting up to rob me. They had the whole entire room blacked out. Somebody hiding behind the wall, and she tried to invite me in to deliver her pizza. I was like, uh, "I was like, dude, I'm out of here." <laughs> I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The, the, you know, I had goosebumps over my entire body. You know, every neuron was firing. Run. <laughs> And um, uh, I get back to the shop and I asked, you know, do we call the cops? And it's like, well, we have nothing. They'll be gone by the time they get there. So there's no point, really. You know, we'll just, you know, blacklist that place for sure. And um, um, Dylan, my buddy there at the shop, you know, he asked me, he's like, he's like, dude, you're six and a half feet tall. What are you worried about? And I looked at him and I was like, dude. A pipe wrench to the back of the neck will knock me out just as instantly as it'll knock you out. <laughs> no, I didn't leave the pizza. <laughs> I wasn't getting anywhere near that bitch. <laughs> no way. <laughs> there was only one direction I was going. Further away. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That really... Uh, I mean, I've been in dangerous situations before. But that's the closest I've ever actually been to, you know, you know, what do you call that? Um, um, what do you call it? There, there's a word for that, for that sensory um, perception um, where you can, can just feel the imminent violence coming. Yeah. murderous intent that's the word murderous intent i could feel the murderous intent um you know it is the first time i've ever felt it i've been in dangerous situations i've been in situations where um you know i knew that other person you know they were probably going to hurt me if i wasn't careful but there was never murderous intent it was more like i want to get away or i just want to stop you um that was the first time i think i felt murderous intent coming from another human being Meaning another human being who's specifically meant to do me harm. That is not a comfortable feeling. <laughs> I mean, it, it really freaked me out the rest of the night, man. I was on edge at every stop. I was looking around over my shoulder. I was looking around corners, you know, because I was I was hyped up. I was you know I was pumped, and you know the adrenaline was going, the emotions were going, because I'd never experienced that before, so I didn't quite know how to deal with it. Oh, God, Cabby, Jesus Christ. That's a dangerous job in New York City. Man, fuck that. <laughs> you know, be a cabbie? Sure, New York City? Nah, you can have that job. <laughs> I, mean, I, I get it, you gotta do what you gotta do, but Jesus, man, that's not a job I want. And um, I explained to him, I was like, I don't care how fast I am. I don't care how strong I am. You know, can I squish you by sitting on you? Yes. But, you know, a, a pipe to the back of the head is going to knock me out or kill me just as it'll kill you. I mean, 
we both got skulls that can be cracked, you know? Oof. That's a, that's a crazy feeling. That really is a crazy feeling. There, there, there's something to that. Like, um, you know, that, that, that concept of murderous intent. There, there is something to that. There is some kind of connection between people there because I absolutely felt it. Maybe it was the culmination of subliminal signals and intuition, but whatever it was, I felt it. You know, I you know just all the weird things that she was doing. You know, I I mean I noticed the weird things. You know, why is she in a bikini? Basically, you know, bra and panties. You know, why does she have a chair sitting right there at that wall at the beginning of darkness? Hey, red light. You know, why did they black out the entire room? They even covered the alarm clock so it doesn't produce any light. Like it was black. You saw nothing. And um it was what really set me off was when I saw her eyes flick over like that. And I was like, what did she just look at? And I look over at the at the wall. I'm seeing wall, of course, because I can't see through the wall. And I just got the feeling immediately that that murderous intent feeling then and I knew without any shadow of a doubt that there was someone standing right there on that behind that wall with a weapon. Probably not a gun, and they wouldn't be doing it in the hotel room. Probably a, a wrench, a pipe, hammer, whatever. <laughs> yeah, blunt force trauma. It doesn't matter how big you are. If I put a pipe to the back of your head, you're going down. Uh, I don't care if you're The Rock. I don't care if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't care if you're Donald Trump. I don't care if you're a six-year-old little girl. You, you take a pipe wrench to the back of the head, it's, it's nighty-night. <laughs> uh, yeah, all your kung fu and your karate and your gun skills ain't going to do you any good. You know, if you're, if you're dumb enough to get yourself in a position where you can be stuck like that, you know, you, 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 you got to remember, no matter how good you are, no matter how much training you think you've undergone, you've not, gone, you've not undergone live fire training. Why do you think most cops suck at, at using their gun? Because most cops never have to use their gun. And no amount of training, I don't care how much you go to the range, I don't care how much you train, that doesn't prepare you for live fire. Well, it does, but it doesn't fully prepare you for live fire, which is why most cops suck in a live fire scenario, because it's usually their first time. Um, um, you know, contrary to popular belief, most cops aren't ex-military. Only about 25% of law enforcement is ex-military. Um, probably because most military gets sick of the bullshit <laughs> at police stations. But, um, yeah, that was... That was definitely a situation I never want to repeat. You know, what if I'd missed one of those cues? What if I would have just innocently walked in not even thinking twice about it, you know? Just... Yep. And the moment you stop thinking there is, that's when you're, you're fucked. Uh, when I, I got into that situation at the Motel 6 delivering pizza, and they tried to lure me into the room to rob me. <laughs> yeah, and flamethrowers under your cars, too. <laughs> Holy shit. I saw that video because um, 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 nothing happened. I, I got out of there when I, when I sensed bad was about to happen. And I bolted the fuck out of there. But, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a freaky scenario, you know. You know, I never thought twice about walking into a person's house before. Um, you know, I, I, I was never dumb. I didn't, just, you know, waltz in. You know, I was cautious. You know, I check my, you know, I always check my surroundings. You know, you know, what's going on here? Is there anything fishy going on? No, it's just an 80-year-old lady, and she wants help putting the pizza on the counter. And so I'll do that. And, um, but, you know, I was a bit more cautious after that. <laughs> I was just a little bit more careful after that. You know, just when, when, when it happens, you just, it's crazy. The, the, the fact that you're going to rob me for a $25 pizza and the 20 bucks in my pocket? Are you serious? You're going to try to kill me for $20? That's nuts. That's just fucking nuts. 
<laughs> the porn shop probably saved me. <laughs> oh, now that I think about it, the porn shop probably saved me. Um, that's probably why she was in panties and a bra, was to probably to get me off my guard and, you know, the male instinct, you know, a pretty woman or whatever. She wasn't very pretty. But um, she wasn't ugly either, but you know, wasn't pretty. But um, I didn't think anything of it. You know, her being there half naked meant nothing to me. And that was probably because of the porn shop. I'd seen so much of that that it just didn't mean anything. Are you serious? People are crazy, man. Kill someone for five bucks. It's probably what the pack of smokes is worth. You know, you see things in humanity and you go, that's amazing. And then you see other parts of humanity and you go, why do we exist? <laughs> why? Why do we exist? Well, what it did teach me is that I have good instincts. You know, I was perceptually aware of my environment and I had the, the correct instinctive response. Stop, get out of there. Don't even talk. Don't even negotiate. Just go on. You know, just... So, uh, at least I know I'm not going to just blunder myself into a murder. You know, <laughs> they're going to have to work a little harder to get me. <laughs> A little bit harder, you know. Uh, it's not a toot of a horn or anything. That's just, you know, that's just an instinctive thing. That's not something I trained or learned, you know. Uh, at least I didn't let my dick think for me, and I used my brain, and I, I listened. A lot of the times it comes down to um, listening to your intuition, listening to your instincts that are telling you go, and then you don't listen to those things, and you get into trouble. But, um... Yeah, I mean, I've had my share of gruesome situations. We had, there was a car accident on Route 130 in um, Burlington, New Jersey. We had this little cut where we take, cross over, circle, go across the Burlington Bristol Bridge. And um, when the I, I, I've been personally involved in probably a dozen accident scenes just because I was there. Exactly. You know, sometimes running, is, I'm a run toward danger kind of guy. I've, I've discovered that that's not a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's not a special thing. That's not a horrible thing. It just is. I've discovered that after enough incidents have occurred that I've determined I am a run toward danger kind of guy. If, if I see something or hear something or sense something bad happening, I'm going toward it to see what I can do. Not as a gung-ho, you know, come in cowboy white knight kind of thing, but just to see if I can help. And, um, the, um, they had a, there was a car accident right in front of us. Like, I mean, it was the car in front of us as we were going through the light. So if we were a tiny bit faster or they would have a tiny bit slower, it would have been us. And, um, <clears throat> there's a family in a minivan and this little tiny sports car doing had to be doing 80 plus i mean he came in like a lightning flash blew the red light and just fucking pummeled this minivan now if you know anything you know minivans are heavy minivans are not lightweight vehicles most minivans are four to six thousand pounds minivans are people talk about pickup trucks pickup trucks aren't the tanks on the road your, your family minivan is the tank on the road most minivans outweigh pickup trucks Pickup trucks are only really heavy when they're loaded. Or when you start getting into the larger pickup trucks. F-250, F-350, F-450. But when you're talking your standard F-150 pickup truck, they're lightweights. They're light, they're light vehicles. They're not heavy vehicles. Minivans, on the other hand, those things are heavy. And um, this little sports car slammed into this minivan. I wish for all the world that dash cams were a thing back then because that video would have been phenomenal. I would have given that video to my physics instructors as a demonstration video because 
it was as horrifying as it was, it was truly a marvel of physics. <coughs> so, <coughs> this car, this minivan, I watched this minivan lift off the ground. The minivan is now no longer touching the ground. This minivan rotated 180 degrees on the x-axis and 180 degrees on the y-axis and landed back on its roof facing us. That little 1,800, 2,200-pound sports car, it was one of those little two-door coupe convertible deals, that little sports car hit that minivan with enough energy to fully revolve it 180 degrees on two axes before it landed on its roof facing us. The, I know it's weird, but as I'm leaping out of my vehicle and damn near strangling myself on a seatbelt because the buckle didn't release as fast as I was hitting the button, <laughs> I almost choked myself on the seatbelt getting out of the van. We were in a big cargo van, an E-150 um, cargo van. You know, no windows on the side, just old, ugly cargo van. And um, I leaped out of the van, and I was running toward the minivan. And the thought in my head was trying to figure out the energy involved. <laughs> How much energy had to be transferred from that little sports car to that minivan to do that, to lift you know, if the van's five or 6,000 pounds and everything in it, you're talking, you know, total 7,000, 6, 7,000 pounds. To lift six or 7,000 pounds off the ground and flip it 180 degrees on two axes and land on its roof and hardly move. It only moved maybe 20 feet from where it was. That is a phenomenal amount of energy. That car had to be flying. He had to just... He, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if he was doing over 100. I mean, whatever he was doing, it was fast. And so we get to the minivan, and the first thing I do is I yell at the people inside to stop trying to unbuckle. Because <laughs> the lady's dazed, and she's trying to pull her seatbelt, and I'm yelling at her, stop, stop, stop. And, and she finally looks at me. I was like, you're upside down. If you undo the seatbelt, you're going to fall on your head. And she finally looks around and realizes she's upside down, because she just got into an accident, so she's out of it. Not injured. Nobody, those two weren't injured. And, um, so, you know, my dad gets the, lady, the guy on the other side. I get the lady in the driver's seat. You know, we cradle the shoulders and say, okay, unbuckle your seatbelt. And then we bring them down. Um, so they can climb out of the car and get out of the car. Then we go over to the sports car. And I see something that, um, if I had nightmares, it would give me nightmares. I, I don't really remember my dreams. So I don't really have nightmares. But it was, um, nightmare inducing. Um, the, the parent had a child on their lap. And so, of course, the child wasn't buckled in. And the child ate the windshield. So the child's face was <laughs> in the windshield. Yeah, he, uh, I'm bigger than him. I'm taller. He's 6'2", I'm 6'4". But yeah, he's, he's big like me. Um... The, um, uh, the, the child's face slid along the windshield. The child was okay. He ended up being fine. You know, obviously, he had to go to the hospital and surgery and shit. But um, I guess because of my own eye problems, it really freaked me out. The, um, the kid's eye was all puffed up because his eyelids had filled with glass. He had scraped along the windshield and glass had packed up inside of his his um, ocular cavities underneath his eyelids. And apparently he ended up being fine. Didn't even damage his eyes. Amazing. Mind-blowing. But seeing it was just, oh, man. That is just, especially to a kid, you know? Shame on that fucking parent for carrying him in a lap. What the hell, man? But they were okay, too. Mm -hmm. The cop actually did call us back a few weeks later and said the kid was fine. He'll fully recover. No, no permanent injuries. But yeah, that's, that's disturbing kind of shit to see that kind of shit, you know? The energies involved in these... I tell people the, the miracle creation of modern technology is automotive engineering. 
You see, we, we don't want to slow down the speed limits. We don't want to loosen up traffic on the highways because that's really, really expensive. So what we've done to make driving safer is to legislate the auto industry. And it's probably one of the most successful harsh legislation regimens ever. You know, besides the EPA. The EPA is just fucking amazing. As, as problematic as the EPA can be, it's one of the best things we ever did. All you have to do is look at some pictures from our old cities and rivers before the EPA and after the EPA. And if you don't think the EPA is useful, you're part of the problem. <laughs> Are they angels? No. Do they ruin a lot of people? Yes. Have they done more good than wrong? Yes. The, the, the amount that they've cleaned up um, our country is just phenomenal. But anyway, um, we place the large burden, most people don't realize this, on automotive engineering. Um, that's one of the reasons why all cars are starting to look the same. You notice that the cars don't really look all that different anymore? That's one of the reasons why some manufacturers are actually excited about electric cars, because it allows them to design cars again. Cars were starting to become more like NASCAR cars, where you know they, they were all different cars, but they're all basically the same. And the reason they're all basically the same Wow. Yeah, it's rough. I'll tell you about the box truck that filled my arm with glass later. <laughs> that was not fun. But um the um Um the what we've done is we've engineered the cars to be safer. We haven't made the drivers safer. We've made the cars safer. The number of accidents I've seen where in the early days I would look at the accident and go, uh, there's corpses. People are dead here. Okay? There, there are dead bodies here. And then you walk up, not a scratch. People are walking around uninjured. You look at the person, look at the mangled mess that is their car. You go, how the fuck is that person walking? <laughs> and not just walking, there isn't a scratch on them. You know, uh, uh, maybe you know, some chest burn from the seatbelt or, or some face reddening from the airbag. But not a scratch on them. That car's wrapped around the fucking pole. It's a pretzel now. It's like the car momentarily became fluid. <laughs> and this person walked away. The, the engineering that goes into making these things safe? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, enforcement's irrelevant. Um, enforcing the requirement to have seatbelts is relevant. Airbags are a catch-22. The initial creation of airbags was problematic. Um, in fact, in the early days, I wanted to disable the airbag in my car because um, all I knew was that um, you know my glasses would come off my face in an accident and then the explosive charge in the airbag would drive the glasses through my skull. Um, in the early days, the problem was we created airbags to compensate for people not wearing seatbelts. And one of the things they did to compensate was make the explosive charge in the airbag stronger so that the airbag would come out faster to catch the person not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> because if you're wearing a seatbelt, you're never going to touch the airbag. The airbag's never going to touch you. You're just going to get powder in your face. Now, later on, when they started adding things like side curtain airbags and seat side airbags, then things got interesting. That really started changing um, not so much saving lives, but reducing injuries. Because the car's engineering was already saving lives, those extra airbags started really reducing the kind of injuries we saw. So, you know, your head gets whipped to the side and slams into the, the top of the A and B pillar there. Now, now that side curtain airbag stops you from busting your skull open or cracking your neck. Um, but the initial early airbags was a compensation for people not wearing seatbelts. Um... But yeah, the, um, if you're wearing your seatbelt properly, those front airbags aren't going to do anything. They're, they're going to do nothing. Um, 
In fact, I, I remember reading an article once where some of the European companies were actually thinking about, you know, programming the so that um, in a frontal accident, for example, if the car detected you had your seatbelt properly tensioned, it wouldn't even deploy the airbag, it would disable the airbag to avoid the risk of an airbag going off in your face. But I think they got, I think they never went anywhere with that because of liability. You know, what if the airbag didn't go off and it should have? Now they're liable, so they decided that we're just going to set everything off. <laughs> and so now you get into an accident, your car's totaled because, you know, $15,000 in airbags went off. <laughs> but, you know, that's our, that's our lawsuit crazy country we live in. But, um, yeah, the, 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 the accidents that you see today and people walk away from, that's just a marvel of modern engineering. It's just incredible. Um, yeah, that's where the, all the side curtain and stuff airbags came from. Yes. And um, so, it's, so we haven't made our roads safer. We haven't made our driving safer. We've just made the cars so ridiculously safe that you can get into a ridiculously monstrous accident and walk away from it. It's, it's really pretty incredible. And it all comes down to structural engineering and crumple zones. There's a, there's a funny joke. Um, it, it, it's not really funny, but it is funny. It's funny. Okay? But, you know, it's meant in jest. So, you know, you know Volvos are, meant, are really safe cars. And so the Volvo owner walks up to the Hummer owner. And this is back in the day when Hummers were first starting to come out. And he says, yeah, I've always been fascinated by these Hummers. He's like, I wonder, where are the crumple zones on a Hummer? And the Hummer driver turns around and says, it starts at your front bumper and ends at your rear bumper. <laughs> so he's saying the Volvo is the crumple zone for the Hummer. <laughs> it's dark humor, but it's funny. And, um... Yeah, they probably do. They are incredibly reliable. It's NASA technology, believe it or not. You know, the spacecraft that fly to Mars and those parachutes fire their pyro charges and successfully deploy? It's NASA technology in your, um, in your airbag. Uh, the, some of the larger ones have, um, I think someone measured it that the Newtons of force was equivalent to an H rocket motor. The amount of energy that the airbag deploys to... Um, but it's not that it has to, it's not that it needs a lot of force to deploy an airbag. It doesn't take that much force to deploy an airbag. To deploy an airbag in milliseconds, meaning to get it inflated fast enough to actually stop your skull from hitting something, requires a tremendous amount of force to make that happen quick enough. The speed at which this stuff happens, it'll, it'll blow your mind. Oh, yeah. The number of people nowadays were, again, we're, instead of making better drivers, we're just making safer cars. That's why I'm telling you, self-driving cars will happen. And it will happen in our lifetime. It will happen in the next 20 years. Yeah, airbags are scary shit. When I see mechanics pranking people with airbags, like, dude, you're asking to crack someone's spine. And those things are fucking dangerous. Oh, the you, you, no, Ben, you have never seen an airbag deploy in real time. No human being has ever seen an airbag deploy in real time. It happens so fast, you can't see it. One moment, there's no airbag. And the next moment, there's instantly an airbag. You never saw anything in between. <laughs> you did not see the deployment. You saw the deflation after it deployed. You need about a thousand frames per second to see an airbag deploy. <laughs> it, it really is that fast. It's it's it's, it's incredible. It's just it, it's one of those uh, it's one of those Looney Tune cartoon things where it's just instant. It just happens instantly. It really is incredibly fast. <sighs> Woo! It, 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 it's 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 a marvel of engineering. It's an absolute. Modern-day automobiles are a marvel of engineering. Even my Geo Metro, the death trap that it was, was still a marvel of engineering for its time. I mean, the, the number of times I've seen people in these little cars survive because they bounce off. The car's so light that they deflect instead of just crushing them. And um, to give you an idea, they did a test. Um, the, you know, the, um, the, the smart car, the Smart 4-2, that little tiny two-door car, I want one so bad. 
I love the idea of that car. <laughs> I don't like the idea that it's a German car, so it's expensive, but... Oh, nice. Um, the, um... Um... The Smart 4-2. They... One of the worst kind of accidents you can get into is an uh, uh, unmovable object, you know, concrete wall or barricade at an oblique. So not a head-on, but where you get deflected. And um, now keep in mind, if anybody was in this car for this test, they'd be dead. Okay? No amount of engineering can stop you from being a victim of physics. Everybody is a victim of physics. And they, they slam this smart 4-2 into this concrete 45-degree barricade at 75 miles an hour. Now keep in mind, that is a lethal impact. Even in that marvel of engineering, that is a lethal impact. You're, you're going, you know, the way we stop accidents from being lethal, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you jump out of an airplane, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop at the bottom that kills you, right? It's not touching the ground that kills you, it's the suddenness of the stop. It's what kills you is acceleration, okay? So imagine this. Um, if, if I punch you, you're going to feel it, okay? You're, you're gonna, your skin's going to sting and you're going to feel it. But if you can move with the punch, it feels like nothing. If you could time it and move with the punch, you barely feel a thing. It's like I, it's like I did that, okay? Um, that's how crumple zones work. Crumple zones work. They can't stop you from experiencing the energy of the impact. But what they can do is spread the energy over a larger period of time. And what kills you is not the energy your body absorbs, but the instantaneous energy your body absorbs. So, um, you know, you're, oh, here's a perfect example. Take these slabs of a cell phone, okay? These cell phones are dense slabs, right? You drop one, it shatters. <laughs> it, it just goes, it's, 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 every piece of glass on it is shattered. Why? Because when you drop something this dense and this heavy, and it hits, especially if it hits the ground on a corner, okay? Especially if it hits on the corner, you're concentrating all that impact force on that little tiny space. This is an inflexible object. It's glass, it's, it's, it's aluminum, titanium, magnesium. It's inflexible. Uh, yeah, that would suck. <laughs> uh, that would be a bad day. You better hope you have a parasite to repair your heart. <laughs> um, the, um, the amount of energy the phone is experiencing is not that much. You know, 32 feet per second per second over, um, you know, four feet drop. You know, four foot drop from here, okay? So how come when I drop it on a carpet, absolutely nothing happens to the phone? But when I drop it on the tile, you know the, the worst place for phone damage? The most deadly place to a cell phone? Bathrooms. Because everything is ceramic and tile. So everything is absolutely hard and unmoving. So there's no give. The energy experienced by the phone is not that great. Okay, it's I don't I don't remember how to do the math, but it's not that great when you know the phone hits the ground. So why did the phone shatter? Because all the energy is being concentrated into that little tiny space right there, and it's happening over milliseconds of time. Um, and that's because the two objects don't give. So the two objects hit. And it's immediate transfer of all of the energy all at once. It's like the difference between an, um, um, let's see, it's like the difference between, um, you know, uh, an E6 rocket engine and an E30 rocket engine. They both contain about the same amount of energy. So the total energy contains about the same. But the E6 rocket motor goes, The sound I'm making, that's how long the motor's burning, okay? The E30 goes... <laughs> same energy, 
tiny amount of time. So that's the difference between total energy and instantaneous energy. Now, if the accident exceeds total energy for what you can survive, you're just dead. Doesn't matter what kind of crumple zone you have, you're dead. If your car goes off a cliff, you're dead. Doesn't matter how many airbags you have, doesn't matter how much crumple zones you have, you're dead. Um, but assuming the energy level involved is survivable, how much damage it does to you depends on the rate at which the energy is transferred to you. The way we describe this is acceleration. Okay? We call it, sometimes we call it deceleration. That's not actually correct. All acceleration is just acceleration. We are just providing a direction to the acceleration by saying acceleration or deceleration. To the universe, it's all acceleration. Um, just, you know, deceleration is you accelerating that way instead of that way. Um, now, I take this little rubber case, this 50 cent piece of TPU rubber that actually has some decent reinforced corners. And I put this phone inside this little rubber case. I can now drop this phone on its corner because the face is still a danger, okay? But assuming I hit the corner every time, I could drop this phone on its corner from five or six feet all day long over and over again, and this phone will never break. Why? Because that little skin of TPU is the difference between the phone experiencing 2,000 Gs of impact force, instantaneous impact force, and experiencing 50 Gs of impact force. 50 Gs of instantaneous force, it can survive. 2,000 Gs of instantaneous force, it cannot survive. And because the floor is inflexible, it's a tile floor, concrete floor, whatever, and because the phone is inflexible, when those two objects hit, the instantaneous transfer of force is very high. The overall energy is low, but the instantaneous force transfer is very high. And the materials can't handle that, and they shatter. Just by adding this little TPU case, especially with these little bumpers, that provides just the tiniest amount of give. It's only a couple millimeters. It might be two millimeters, maybe three millimeters of give. But now you're taking all of that energy, and instead of expending that energy in one one hundredth of a millimeter, I am now spreading that energy over three millimeters. And that has a, you know, what, one one hundredth versus three? That is a, um, that is a 3,000% reduction in the instantaneous transfer of energy. The total energy is the same, but it's a 3,000% reduction in the instantaneous peak energy delivered to the phone. And it can easily survive that. So you can drop it all day long. Now the only way this phone breaks is if it lands this way and a rock hits the screen. You know, now you're back to instantaneous transfer of force. That's why they keep making Gorilla Glass stronger and stronger. Um... Well, the same exact thing happens in your car. If I can spread out the amount of time you have to accelerate from 50 miles an hour to zero miles an hour, I decrease the amount of instantaneous force that your body experiences. And if I can get that amount of instantaneous force below the threshold of injury, you walk away. And that's what our crumple zones do. That's what the airbags do. That's what the seatbelts do. Well, the seatbelts keep you from moving. That's the first thing. So it keeps you, you know, you, you should watch some videos on YouTube of unsecured passengers in cars that get into accidents. It's not just that these people roll around the inside of the car like rag dials. The speed at which they roll around the inside of this car like, this person doesn't go, Rah! now I'm on the ceiling. No, this person goes, boom, they're on the ceiling. What the fuck? <laughs> it's like, they're seated, bam, they're on the ceiling. <laughs> it's, it's almost as quick as an airbag going off. You almost have to slow it down frame by frame to 
even see how they got from the seat to the ceiling. Okay, the purpose of the seatbelt is to stop you from doing that. <laughs> Because that's how you get broken. <laughs> exactly. Then now that's a case of where you're using um well that's well it's essentially a crumple zone. You're using a blade of armor. The PLA is absorbing the energy and saving the foam. Um that's why I don't like I don't like metal bumper cases. You'll see those thin bumper cases. Um, if there's no shock absorbing material inside, um, that's just an anti scratch pretty case. It's not really going to save your phone in the drop. You really need TPU, and you really need that little bit of expanded. See how that little, see how that edge of the um, the, the edge there is expanded. You really need that. Without that, you guys have seen it. You drop the old um, um. Oh, what's it called? Um. The old Bakelite, you know, phone or the old plastic flashlight. You drop it, it hits the ground, it blows itself apart into a million pieces. Just add a TPU bumper. Um, Seatbelts don't have many limitations. Um, my uncle was a state trooper, and the one thing he told me was that he's never unbuckled a corpse. And, you know, I didn't quite fully understand what he said until I went home and thought about it. Uh, I was a relatively intelligent kid, but um, still, it didn't quite hit me. And uh, I was like, what do you mean he never unbuckled a corpse? What he meant was, every time he found a person in a seatbelt, they were alive. The only time he found a corpse was when they weren't belted. That doesn't mean everybody unbelted was a corpse, but it does mean everybody who was belted was alive. Now, that doesn't that's not 100%. I mean... Like I said, if the total energy involved exceeds what you can survive, it doesn't matter what kind of crumple zone you have. I mean, if you're going off the cliff into the rocks of the ocean, you can tighten that seatbelt as much as you want. You're still dead. <laughs> All right, so there, there is a limit. But um, the vast majority of accidents we get into, you know, 99.99999% of the accidents that we get into are of the kind that you can survive if you're belted in and you're using a relatively modern car. I mean, yes, yeah, sure, if you, if you drive under a semi, you're getting decapitated. <sighs> I mean, <laughs> the, the, there are limits, okay? But, um... Well, it happens. It happens. Especially on older vehicles. These, some of these, you know, these cars that we cherish as collector cars, and they are beautiful. The 57 Bel Air is a beautiful car. I mean, you know, uh, you know, uh, Chevelle SS is a gorgeous looking car. I love the look of that car. But they're death traps. Those cars are so unsafe compared to today's car. I'd rather have a whole bunch of steel around you. No, you're not going to have steel around you. You're going to have steel through you, okay? Because that car is going to collapse and it's going to crush you like an egg. <laughs> okay? All that steel is not going to protect you. The steel is what's going to kill you. Um, you know, the, those older cars, just, you know, five mile an hour accidents, no problem. Anything more serious, they're death traps. So, you know, sure, a modern car gets into an accident, it's total. Even a minor accident will total. My, my electric car got totaled from a rear ending. She, all she did was her foot slipped off the brake, hit the gas, and she hit me pretty hard, but not hard enough to hurt me or anything, and not even hard enough for me to see any immediate obvious damage. Oof. Yeah, and that's even in a Honda. Jesus. Older Honda or newer Honda? You know, like, we're talking 20-plus years ago? You know, pre-2000s? You know, back then, the SUVs were more like the 50s and 60s cars. They were metal tanks. Yes, I was, that's what we were just talking about. We were talking about the 75 mile an hour smart car test. And first of all, remember, if you were inside that smart car, you'd be dead. That's like, that's like going off the cliff. It doesn't matter how safe the car is. The total energy involved is going to kill you. But the purpose of that test was to show off the tritium frame construction. The F1 race car frame construction they used in that car. That car was destroyed. 
but two things were important. The passenger cabin was intact. Nothing from outside the passenger cabin had intruded into the passenger cabin, and the passenger cabin itself had not collapsed onto the space that would have been the passengers. And the goddamn door still opened. <laughs> so, you know, now while nobody would have survived that accident, you're, you're not usually going to have that kind of an accident. You know, in your typical city accident where that kind of car is going to be used, it is very survivable because people were worried about the safety of a tiny car like that. But your, your normal size cars, they have crumple zones, airbags, seatbelts, stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's unusual, Ben, but, you know, shit happens. Like I say, everybody is a victim of physics. <laughs> physics is heartless. Physics is a, it's a bastard. It doesn't care. You know, you, you get on the wrong end of the physics stick and think your number's up. Uh, no, it's not. The, the, see the, now, see, that's where you're wrong. It's not marketing hype. The hard data shows it. You look at the number of accidents per capita. First of all, this is something that people have difficulty looking at. You have to look at the numbers on a per capita basis and not on an absolute basis. Because what a lot of people don't realize, when Ben Brady was growing up, the United States had one half the population it currently has. One half. We have more than doubled the population of this country since Ben Brady was born. Um, let's put in, let's say you were born, uh, well, maybe not when you were born. I don't know when you were born. But let's use 19, let's use World War II, 1945. U.S. Pop, 1945. The population in 1945 was 139 million people. No, like, like they even explained in that test um, on the smart car that the, that accident would not be survivable. Okay? If you were in that smart car and you slammed into a 45-degree concrete barricade at, four, at 75 miles an hour, you're dead. Okay? They, they were very clear about that in that video when they ran that. They explained that that was not a survivable impact. Other aspects of physics would have killed you. What would not have killed you? The steering wheel would not have impaled your chest. The cabin of the car would not have collapsed and crushed you. That was the point of showing that accident. We were just, just kept ramping up the speed beyond what would kill a person just to see what it would survive. You can't use real people in crash tests. <laughs> that would make you no better than Nazis experimenting on people to learn. <laughs> you, you, yes, they learned a lot. We learned, a, believe it or not, medical science expanded tremendously as a result of the Nazis experimenting on live subjects. Um, medical science expanded tremendously as a result of the Nazis experimenting on live subjects. But it can never justify it. <laughs> I mean, but they, they have done that. They've got military personnel who volunteered for live testing. There's that one guy who kept going on that rocket cart when they were um the rocket sled when they were developing ejection seats. And um but it's not ethical to use live subjects. It's immoral. You can't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't trust a company that was willing to use live subjects in their tests. <laughs> Actually, that was my phone. But yeah, my door is the same thing. <coughs> um, you can't use live subjects. It's immoral. <laughs> um, but anyway... You, the, the population of the United States at the end of World War II was 139 million people. Today, the population is 334 million people. An almost 300% increase in the number of people. And an equally large... And keep in mind, automobiles were only 40 years old. <laughs> okay? So, they hadn't really advanced very far. 
Um, the modern automobile was only four years old. The, um, so if you compare, you know, number of accidents versus number of fatalities, meaning you're looking at survival rate, you'll, 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 the difference is like this. Like, here's 1945, and here's today. <laughs> I mean, so few people die of car accidents that you got morons using the comparison of car accident deaths and gun deaths to justify gun control. That's how safe cars have gotten, okay? <laughs> that they're comparing them to something designed to kill people. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really kind of sad to see it, but it just shows you, yeah, 166 million in 1957, so hardly any increase at all. Only an extra, not even an extra 20 million people. Oh, 25 million people. 26 million people, something like that. Yeah, yeah. 26 million people, 27 million people. So, you know, even compared to when Ben Brady was born, we've almost, we've absolutely doubled the population. What's 16 and 16 is 32. So 166, 166, that would be um, 330. So yeah, we've doubled the population since Ben Brady was born. From 166 million people to over 334 million people. Now look at the number of cars on the road. Do we even have statistics on that? Number... Let's see here. So between July 1st and December 31st, 1945, um, the big three manufactured 185,000 cars and seven other producers manufactured 57,000 cars. So eight. That's 250,000 cars. There are currently 1.47 billion vehicles on the road today on Earth, and 19% of those are in the United States. <laughs> uh, so that's, um, let's see, 1.474 times, let's just do point 0.2. So that's, um, what? 294 million cars, no, that's 30 million cars on the road today. 30 million cars. Now, when you look at automotive fatalities relative to the number of people there are, relative to the number of cars there are, relative to the number of accidents there are, you realize that driving a car is pretty much the safest goddamn thing you can do in this country short of flying on an airplane. Now, as a pedestrian, cars might not be so safe. <laughs> um, yeah, well, look at the look at the huge increase just from. Um, that's worldwide, by the way. That's not the U.S. Um, that's worldwide. So you'd have to figure out how much of that was the U.S. Um, so we've gone from fifty-five million cars in nineteen fifty-seven to um, one point five billion cars in 2023. Yeah, that, that's a big difference. <laughs> Just a smidge different. Um, but um, cars are ridiculously safe. And that's not because we've made driving safer. We haven't. I mean, I've told you guys this multiple times. My goddamn cat could pass a driving test. The sole purpose of a driving test is to um, give, what do you call it, when you um, when you give um, illegitimate credit to something you're 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 just um you know, yeah 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 it's fine you're um um i forget the word for that again i don't know why i have trouble remembering words now it's, it's driving me nuts but um it's when you give false credence to something um <laughs> yeah just make sure there's no mice around you're fine and no squirrels too um but the point is um our driving tests are a joke 
The sole purpose of a driver's license in the U.S. is control and revenue. That's it. We've stripped people of their right to drive because driving is a right. We've stripped people of their right to drive and give it back, given it back to them under the false pretense of privilege for the sake of control, subjugation, and revenue. And, you know, that's bullshit, but what are you going to do? Um, um, but even with our joke of a licensing system, even with our non-existent training for drivers, you know, it's literally a joke, um, even with our joke of an infrastructure maintenance system, I mean, look at our roads, okay? Even with all that, it's that safe to drive a car. And that's because of the enforcement that we have against automotive engineers to make the cars, the drive that we have to make the car safer, 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 safer. And it worked. It's the cars are ridiculously safe today. It's like you're coddled in a cloud of cotton when you drive a car for all intents and purposes. Um, now, if we can make the road safer and the drivers safer at the same time, we can pretty much get rid of automotive deaths. <laughs> I mean, even just making people take a defensive driving course, just a basic defensive driving course, would probably have such an impact. Oh no! In most states, oh, this is see, this is what uh, I, I, I just want to reach through the screen and bitch slap people who think they're holier than thou because you know they drive a car and they pay a gas tax and your electric car doesn't. I was like, I pay more road tax than you do as a gas driver. Electric car drivers pay more road tax than gas car drivers do because the taxes on our electric bill make the taxes on your gas look like chicken shit. <laughs> and you know, but no, 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 the gas tax goes to the road. No, it doesn't. In some states, it does. Okay, in some states, it does. In most states, Gas tax goes to the general fund. It does not go to roads. It is not earmarked for roads. It's just a sales tax, and it goes to the general fund just like any other tax. Okay? So, no, you don't pay more taxes because you drive a car, and he doesn't pay less taxes because he rides a bicycle or drives an electric car. They probably pay more taxes than you do because the gas tax is cheaper at least the chicken shit fertilizes my lawn. Oh, when you have chickens, it fertilizes your lawn. Okay. Um. But yeah, that's that's all a bunch of hokey pokey BS. That doesn't mean anything. You know, in, mo in most states, gas tax goes to the general fund. I mean, the the only state that actually puts their money into um, one of the few states that puts their gas tax into their roads and things related to their roads, you know, you know regulating gas refineries and gas stations and stuff, and stuff like that, is the one state we always rail about, California. You know, there, there, there's a lot of things that are a bit screwed up about California, um, but by and large, the way they run their government is not one of them. If California were a country, their GDP would be number five in the world. <laughs> they would have the fifth largest GDP on Earth. Okay? So whatever the hell they're doing, it, most of it is right. They're doing most of it right. There's some things that are just screwy. Some of the zoning things that they do and some of the ways they, they punish people are just fucked up. It's just that's that's your that's your weird Democrat Republican fighting bullshit thing going on there. Um, you know, here's something else a lot of people don't realize: there are more Republicans in California than there are Democrats. Go look up how many Republicans there are in California and how many Democrats there are in California. Yeah, the, the Republicans outnumber them. <laughs> it would probably have to be considering. Housing and rental prices? Uh, no, zoning requirements, you know, uh, requiring very expensive things in order to get a building permit to build a house. Um, it's one of the things that I'm against. Um, 
we have uh, one of the problems in this country is we've effectively outlawed affordable housing. 3D print a house. It's illegal. In most places, you wouldn't be legally allowed to 3D print a house. And not because it's unsafe. Some aspects might be because of that. But um, a lot of, like, for example, um, they, in Florida, um, there was, a, you know, there was a, a kickback with the utility companies and the trash companies and stuff like that. So they effectively made you paying for those utilities compulsory. If you did not pay for trash service... That was considered a um, a zoning infraction, and your house was considered blighted. Um, if you didn't pay for electricity service, your house was considered blighted. Now, this family, they were generating their own power; they didn't need any more, and they they did not they did not condone waste. So, the amount of trash waste they generated was so small they didn't need to pay a company to come haul away their trash, and um. But the local council wants you paying for trash and paying for utilities because that's where they collect their taxes from. And that's where they get their kickbacks from. So they create these zoning laws that have nothing to do with safety and nothing to do with blight and everything to do with revenue. Um, many of our counties, um, their primary source of income, besides ticket revenue, is um, their property and school taxes. And that creates a problem. That creates a conflict of interest. Because you, um, as a county, you have a vested interest. It is in your best interest for houses to be as large, as complex, and as expensive as possible. Why? Because you can charge a lot more in taxes on the $440,000 house than you can on the $44,000 house. Case in point. I pay 600 bucks a year in taxes on a $45,000 house. If this was a $440,000 house, I'd be paying $3,000 in taxes. See the difference to the county? <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a $2,400 difference to the county. That's why the previous mayor that we ousted was trying to outlaw mobile manufactured homes. Because that was the last vestige of legal affordable housing in the U.S., and local mayors try to outlaw them because by forcing people to build homes, the homes are more expensive, and the homes therefore attract more expensive clientele, the riffraff can go fuck themselves, and you can now tax more. There are places that have minimum room sizes, where except for things like a closet or a bathroom, uh, the one I was reading about it was on the East Coast somewhere, I don't remember what state it was, but the minimum room size was 120 square feet. You had to have a minimum of four rooms. That meant your minimum house size was, um, what is that? Um, 840 square feet plus bathroom, utility, closet, etc. So you're basically saying the minimum house size is about 1,100 square feet. If you tried to make a house smaller than that, it's illegal. Okay? You, the, you, you want to talk to a crowd who learned this firsthand... Talk to anybody in the tiny home movement. Remember, the tiny home movement wasn't originally about $200,000 mobile home RVs that people built to say, I live in a tiny home. Okay, The original movement for a tiny home was for less waste, less need. I don't need that much home. I just need a nice, comfortable space for me to live in. You know, something that is... um. You know, small, like an RV, but not cramped like an RV. You know, something that's a house, but small. Think cottage, you know, small home. And that's where the tiny home movement came from, especially as property prices were starting to go up, taxes were starting to go up. This is in the beginning when that stuff was starting to skyrocket. I'll just build a tiny home and we can all live in the same place. You can't. They learn the hard way. It's illegal. <laughs> what do you mean I can't live in my tiny home? It's illegal. It's not a legal structure. You can't live in that. You're not allowed to live in that. Some of them were basically... Um, oh, it's not the cheat taxes. The taxes are immoral. The taxes themselves are a cheat. Um, the, to me, property taxes should be illegal. There should be no property taxes. There should be no school taxes. Because school taxes are just property taxes. Right? I'm not saying those things don't need to be funded. 
I'm saying you should not be funding them by stealing people's homes. And, you know, I, it's hard to explain this to people. People, you know, you're partially because you're brainwashed to not understand this. You do not own your home. You don't. Well, Ben might. He had an RV. You'd sort of own that, maybe. It's questionable. That, that certificate of title is questionable. Um, but you do not own your home. Um, there was a few places where you could a couple decades ago, but those are gone now. Um, there's a few places in Nevada and Texas where you can still own your own home. But those, I believe those are all gone now. And once those people die, that's it. That title goes away with their death. You cannot legally own a home in the United States of America. No one can. Uh, one exception, churches. Churches have a higher level of ownership than you do. And that, that's a carryover from the old days. Um, um, churches are even resistant to eminent domain. It's pretty hard to override a church's ownership with eminent domain because that was used in the past to, for anti-religious activities. Um, so the churches are pretty solid protection. Um, but you do not own your home. I do not own this home. I own what is called fee simple title. Fee simple title is the highest level of ownership United States law permits. Fee simple title is the right of tenancy. I have the first right of tenancy below the state. All right? Fee simple title means the crown owns the property and you have first right of tenancy subject to the crown. Now, we don't have a crown. We've replaced that with the state. So the state is now the crown for the purpose of this legal document. You have what's called fee simple title. How do you think they're able to charge you rent every year to own your home? How do you think, where do they get off being able to charge you rent to live in your home? Well, because it's not yours, it's theirs. <laughs> and so, of course, the landlord charges you rent. We just renamed it property taxes. But it's just rent. Well, no, it's not. It's property taxes. Oh, yeah? Go look up the definition of rent. Okay? It's amazing how that matches, except it's yearly instead of monthly. It's amazing how it matches the definition of rent. And then on top of that, what happens when you, start pay when you stop paying rent? You get evicted. What happens when you stop paying your government rent? Oh, I mean, property taxes. You get evicted. <laughs> wow, that sounds a lot like rent, doesn't it? <laughs> so we've been stripped of our right to own homes and given this bullshit replacement called fee simple title. Um. If I actually had the power to fix everything, it's one of the first things I would fix. I would eliminate property and school taxes from residences. And, well, see, the problem is, and this is something else people don't realize. Um, Benjamin Franklin understood this, okay? Um, but a lot of people do not realize this. All rights are derived from property. You have God-given rights because you have property. I have the right to tell you to get off my lawn because it's my lawn. You notice you don't have the right to tell the police to get off your lawn. Hmm? Uh, that's not Democrats, Ben. That's conservatives. That's the Republicans. You know, all the corporate CEOs... You know, they're the ones saying you will own nothing and you will like it. Uh, they're all Republicans. <laughs> okay? Um, all rights are derived from property. The reason I have the right to tell you you cannot take my mouse, the reason we call that theft is because I own it. Um, I have the right of free speech because my voice is my property. It belongs to me. I have the right to life and liberty because it's my life, it's my body. Okay, All rights are derived from property. If you don't own any property, 
You have no rights. Simple as that. No property, no rights. So they're slowly taking away all forms of property, and you're losing your rights without even realizing it. I mean, just, just ask the people who just found out that all their bought and paid for Crunchyroll movies or Funimation movies from Sony, oh, oh, oh they weren't purchases. You just licensed those, and we're revoking those licenses now <laughs> for all that digital content you purchased. <laughs> and it is true. Most corporate CEOs of the evil sort are conservative. And those are the ones who are saying you will own nothing and enjoy it. Those are the ones who are handing pre-written legislation to Congress and saying, pass this. I mean, the very idea that you think Democrats can do that, uh, you should be smarter than that, Ben. Democrats have their heads too far up their ass to be able to ever plan something like that. They're, they're, they're too busy arguing about their green this and their windmill that and their carbon tax this. Their heads are way too far up their ass and they are too disorganized to ever plan anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's why the Republicans keep destroying the Democrats to the destruction of all of us um, because the, the, the Republicans are evil they're, they're filthy scum and the Democrats are too stupid and too in their own never never land to do anything about it they're too disorganized to do anything about it yeah, but you're not a scumbag that's a difference <laughs> And ultimately, there's really no difference between Democrats and Republicans. This is hard for people to explain. Um, it's not how they do things, flags they wave. That's not the metric here. The metric is, what's the end goal? What's going to happen when it's all done? And the only real difference between Republicans and Democrats is the color of the rusty mace they're going to shove up your ass. But one way or another... Both of them intend to shove that rusty mace up your ass. They're going to get there a different way. They're going to do it a different way. They're going to use a different kind of ineffective lube. They're going to twist it a little differently as they do it. But either which way, Republican or Democrat, you're getting a rusty mace up your ass. And the whole purpose of the duopoly, and the found, many of the founders of, of this country warned us of this. They warned us of the dangers of political parties that would ultimately devolve to a duopoly of two parties that were essentially the same thing in end result, not in method, but they were effectively, for all intents and purposes, the same thing, and they would keep us fighting back and forth. Oh, the Republicans screwed up. Let's vote Democrat. Oh, the Democrats screwed up. Let's vote Republican. Oh, the Republicans screwed up. Let's vote Democrat. And we just keep going back and forth. <laughs> Brainwashed little Kool-Aid drinking minions just doing the political bidding of these scumbags who are ruining our lives. Also, they could be one extra billion dollars richer. <laughs> Some bipartisan stuff is good. Now, uh, quick history lesson. We actually tried to fix this. And it was Democrats who tried to fix it, of all things. If you, if you, uh, I, I hate to say this because uh, I think Democrats are useless, senile, pathetic morons. You know, they can't get themselves out of a paper bag. But historically speaking, for the last 70 years, all of the good stuff has come from Democratic Party um, administrations, and all of the bad stuff has come from Republican administrations. Now, a lot of people are going to argue against that because these people are ignorant and uneducated, and they don't realize that there is a time lag from when something is done to when you experience the effects of something. And because our administrations are four to eight years in size, these time lags overlap. It's like when you look at the sun, you're not seeing the sun. You're seeing a picture of the sun eight minutes ago. If the sun were to go poof, if, if Q from the Q continuum were to go you humans deserve nothing. No sun for you. We would still see the sun shining in the sky for eight more minutes. Because that's how long the lack of a solar image would take to get here. 
The same thing happens in politics. When you have a nation of 300 million people, in most cases, nothing happens instantly. Usually when it does, it's a disaster. <laughs> if it happens instantly, it's usually a disaster, like COVID response. What a mess that was, huh? <laughs> well, well, no matter what side of the pond you're on, that was a mess. <laughs> um, because we did fast. Most things take, you know, a president will, or an administration, because usually it's not just a president. Believe it or not, the president has a lot less power than people think. They're largely like the Queen of England. They have some power, but they're mostly a figurehead. Um, Congress is where the work... Reconnected. Yeah. Internet momentarily disconnected. So we should be back. Um, executive orders don't have staying power. You know, unless the next president agrees with it, he can stroke of a pen and delete any executive order Trump passes. And the next president can delete any executive order Biden passes. Um, so what has staying power is administration tasks, meaning the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. And the problem is people tend to look at this as, well, okay, well, there's a Republican in office, so it's Republican choices, right? No, that's not quite how it works. There's a Democrat in office, so it's Democrat choices, right? No, that's not quite how it works. Since Obama, this country has been Republican-run. The Democrats have had no say since Obama left office. It has been a Republican-run Congress. Republicans have had carried the majority of votes, not seats, votes, in legislation that matters since Obama. Right? After Obama, Republicans were in charge. During Trump, Republicans are in charge. Right now, during Biden, Republicans are in charge. Republicans are passing all the laws. Any laws that are passing are the responsibility of Republicans for the last eight years. Because Republicans are in charge of Congress. Even in the, even under Trump, in the Senate, Republicans still control the Senate. Well, wait a minute. They only had 48 Republicans. No. They had 50 votes. They had 48 declared Republicans. And then they had Manchin and Cinema who tended on the important bills to vote with the 48 Republicans. So they had 50 votes. All the Democrats had to do was lose one of the independent votes and they couldn't even use their um, tiebreaker vote with the vice president. Republicans are in charge of Congress. This is not discussable. It's not arguable. You can't debate me with it. All you have to do is look at the votes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people say, um, well, gas prices were cheap under Trump. Sure, shut down the entire fucking planet for a year and a half so that gas production gets cut to a tenth of what it normally is, and you can have Trump era prices again <laughs> as if that had anything to do with Trump. <laughs> and, and, and nothing to do with a global pandemic. Whether it was managed properly or not, the gas prices were the result of that. If you look at the gas prices now, and you look at the gas prices pre-COVID, and you adjust for inflation, gas is about the same now as it was under Trump. It doesn't cost any more today. It's the same price. Uh, it's cheaper. No, no, adjust the number for inflation. Oh, it's within 10 cents of the same price it is now. Because guess what? <laughs> Congress doesn't control the fucking price of gas. <laughs> no matter how much they would like to, they don't. <laughs> okay? Um, and neither does the president. Trump does not control the price of gas. He tried. He, he, tried, to, um, he tried to swindle the, um, the gas companies in, with, the, with the National Reserve. Oh, that was... I, I'll, I'll give Trump credit. That was actually a nice trick. He tried to swindle the gas companies, uh, and they saw right through it and said, Fuck you, dude! <laughs> Boy, did that backfire. Oh, yeah, the CEOs of you know, multi-billion dollar oil companies actually have working brains. <laughs> um, people say, well, my taxes went up under Biden. No, they didn't. Your taxes went up under Trump. No, Biden's in office. Trump passed the law. 
Trump passed the law that gave tax cuts to you and corporate America. Trump installed the time bomb trap card in that law such that after just over four years, the corporate tax cuts stayed permanent and the citizen tax cuts expired. Trump did that. That was built into Trump's tax cut law. Why did he install a time bomb trap card into the law? So that if he won re-election, he could just renew the law and say, see, you get continued tax cuts. If he lost the re-election, but still controlled Congress, which the Republicans do, they could prevent the Democrats from renewing the tax law that would extend the tax cuts for American citizens, and so you perceived your taxes as going up. As a result of the trap card the Republican Party put in the bill they passed. The same bill which increased our national debt 30% pre-COVID. That's right, the Republicans under Trump are responsible for one-third of our national debt. Pre-COVID. Before COVID. Before you you even add the expenses of COVID. Okay? And then, during COVID, he hands like $7 trillion to the corporations. And we wonder why inflation's going crazy. (laughs) Oh, but it's Biden. Uh Uh-uh. Are, are, are you dense? Is there something wrong with your brain? Biden is a useless, senile meat sack who probably doesn't have two working brain cells to rub together to create a coherent thought, who spent 47 years in Congress accomplishing absolutely nothing in 47 years in Congress except to enrich his own pockets. He literally couldn't think his way through a doorway without help. And you think he did this? <laughs> that's like that's like 9-11 happening and you finding a, a six-year-old little girl outside and saying, she did it. <laughs> Biden is incapable of causing this. He's too, he's too senile. He's got too much dementia. <laughs> he was supposed to be a puppet, but they didn't get control of Congress, so he's a puppet of nothing. There's basically nothing he can do. Republicans control Congress. Republicans continue to control Congress. And the Republicans have elected what we call, you know, affectionately, a scorched earth tactic. The Republicans have decided we are going to let the country burn because the American population is so stupid that we can convince them to blame it on the Democrats because they're the one in the president's office. Even though we're making all the laws, we're obstructing any law from being passed to fix anything by not permitting enough votes because we control Congress. But the people are going to blame it on Democrats because they're they're nuts. (laughs) And, and, and I guarantee you, if the Democrats were in charge, they'd be doing the same thing to the Republicans. <laughs> oh, don't, don't get me wrong, that would not be any different. <laughs> Whatever puppet was running Biden would be doing the exact same thing to the Republicans if they could. <laughs> it's, politics in this country is fucking batshit insane. It's, it's, it's the definition of idiocracy. You know, I, I, it's it's amazing. You know, there's a um, there's a phrase. There's a very common phrase in fiction that um um uh, I what's the exact? Maybe one of you guys know the exact wording of it. Um, it's reality is stranger than fiction, or the truth is stranger than fiction. Something along those lines. You know, uh, whatever our fiction writers can come up with, it pales in comparison to reality. And as amazing as the movie Idiocracy was, it doesn't come even close to just how preposterous our idiocracy is. <laughs> um, if you were to show the founding fathers of this country Donald Trump and Joseph Biden, they would say, oh, when are we tarring, feathering, and hanging them? 
<laughs> when for hanging. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, they are the two worst candidates we could possibly select for president. You can't get worse. At least we haven't gotten worse yet. Okay. In my opinion, they are the least electable, least eligible candidates that have ever run for office. You literally have an, a literal dinosaur, a useless, senile meat sack, doesn't have two brain cells left to rub together to create a coherent thought, who's a criminal who spent 47 years in Congress accomplishing nothing of any merit whatsoever except to line his pockets. The other candidate is a known wanton criminal who's used bankruptcy to fuck so many people over in his lifetime <laughs> to just screw everybody and steal from as many people as he can. The epitome of the American corporate crook. And these are the two people that two-thirds of the U.S. voting population picked? The rest of the world, they were just dumbstruck. <laughs> the, the rest of the world looks at America and goes, Huh? They did what? They voted for who? <laughs> and do you know what's happening now? The rest of the world is shaking in their pants. Because this nut job idiocracy of a country has 800 military bases all over the world and the largest military the world has ever seen combined. This includes Russia and China and everybody else. And 23 of those 25 nations are our allies. <laughs> Trust me, when this ship sinks... The whole rest of the world is just going to be praying they survive. Because what happens when you corner a rat? They turn vicious. And they lash out. And the rest of the world is afraid that's what's going to happen here. That the United States is going to collapse. And it is. That the United States is going to collapse. And we're going to lash out as we collapse. And that scares the shit out of them. Because there's nothing they can do about it. If the, next 25 na if the next 25 most powerful nations on the planet, 23 of which are our allies, combined forces and said, with our forces combined, we are Captain Planet. Oh, wrong cartoon. <laughs> we shall defeat the evil United States. They'd lose. <laughs> <coughs> Watch some of the videos on um, YouTube Shorts. Some of the military videos that talk about the prowess and the, the danger of the U.S. military. Um, they're kind of funny, kind of a little sad in some places, but they're truthful. We have the best equipped, the best trained, and the healthiest soldiers on the planet. There isn't an, any combination of countries on this planet that can challenge the United States. No one can touch us. With a 10-foot stick, they couldn't even poke us. The, the amount of military power we have is simply mind-boggling. If we took a tiny fraction, I'm talking, here's our military power, let's take this much of it and take it away from the military and put that money for the people of this country we would still be stronger than the next 25 countries combined. You wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. And we could end homelessness, end hunger, and fund universal health care forever. <laughs> and, oh, and cut your taxes in half. <laughs> Just because. That's how much money we funnel into the military. It's, tr it's truly... It's truly awe-inspiring and terrifying at the same time. I mean, uh, they, 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 you, people joke about it online. I mean, fuck with us, 
America. We'll bring freedom to your country next. We'll bring democracy to your country next. That's a threat. <laughs> it means don't piss us off or we're going to stomp you out of existence. <laughs> I mean, people like to say, well, what about Afghanistan? That's been going on for decades. Because we want it to. We won the Afghanistan war in a week. <laughs> After that, it was just funding the military. They just want that perpetual war to keep that military fund roll rolling. That was all that was. <laughs> and not a bad, oddly enough, not a bad business plan. You know, it's it's immoral, it's unethical, you know, it's disgusting, but uh, it it's effective. It worked. I mean, you you got to give whoever thought of that credit. You know. Uh, you know, even though it wasn't the nicest thing to do, it was the smart thing to do. So, you know, give him credit for that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it, the next 40 years is going to be interesting. <laughs> if, you, if you live the next 40 years, it's, it's going it, to be interesting times, that's for sure. I wonder if technology will catch up and change anything. I doubt it. Something we talk about in science fiction corners is um, what would it take? This is a change of subject. What would it take to get us to a post need society? What would it take to get us to a Star Trek society where there's nobody needs for anything? Basically, have whatever you want. No one really has to work. You work because you enjoy working. Um, believe it or not, if we gave everybody instant wealth and nobody had to work, people would still work. You know, because. Life's pretty boring when you got nothing to do. <laughs> now, most of the time, retirement doesn't mean I don't do anything anymore. Retirement means I get to choose now. It's no longer compulsory. I can do what I enjoy and not what I'm forced to do to survive. That's what retirement means. A lot of us aren't going to have it. But, you know, it is what it is. The, um, what would it take to get us to a post-need society? And the first thing I tell people is that well, you need three primary things to get to a post-need society. You need what is essentially, you know, in effect, unlimited, free or cheap energy. Energy needs to be so plentiful and so cheap that it's effectively a non-issue. Um, you need matter replication. Okay, that's, that's critical. Star Trek replicators, you know, that's why they have replicators. They have to can't have a post-need society without replicators. Um, well, technically there is another path to a post-need society. You know, think iRobot. You know, a slave force to be the labor force. That theoretically is also a path to a post-need society, but it has its own issues. A true post-need society needs a matter replication. And you also need a fundamental change in society. Um, without that fundamental change, there's issues. Like, you know, if aliens came by and dropped off, you know, ZPMs and matter replicators, it, it, would, it would not be a good time for mankind. <laughs> you might think it would be, but it wouldn't be. It, it'll end up being a good time, but getting to that good time, not going to be pretty. I tell people the invention, assuming we don't have World War III for another reason... Assuming we manage to avoid, you know, nuclear holocaust and World War III for another reason, um, the, um, the invention of matter replication or anything approximating matter replication will be the trigger for World War III. Um, people don't realize this. Like, 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 how could giving everybody everything they want result in World War III? I want you to think about that for a moment. Um, a post-need society is not a post-want society. It's a post-need society. You no longer need to work for shelter, food, water, clothing, your basic needs in life. Um, you know, things like car insurance and house insurance become a non-issue when the cost to replace those things is zero. 
Um, so things like car insurance go away. Um, oddly enough, it doesn't eliminate money. Money would still exist, but money would only exist for rich people. Money would be this quaint, stupid thing that we used to do, and only rich people would do it. Because um, while we would be totally happy with a replicated phone and a replicated charger and a replicated battery and a replicated house, the rich and powerful would desire things other people can't have. Meaning... They would crave original works. So they would crave an original painting. They would crave an original piece of furniture made by human hands. So there would still be demand for that. And um, they would have to get that demand from within themselves. Like they couldn't ask, you know, Ben to make a nice piece of furniture in his wood shop for them because... Ben has no need for money. So what could the rich people offer Ben to make him put in the work to make a piece of furniture for them? So it'd be interesting how that would work out. But they would be the only ones who would still have money because that would be the only place wealth would still exist. For the rest of us, the new currency would be intellectual ownership. And you would see a... For the first time, you would actually see open source in its prime. Open source would become a new powerhouse because the problem currently with open source is that it's anti-profit and if it's anti-profit nobody wants to do it because we need profit to survive that's why open source projects have a hard time it sucks because i love open source projects but i understand they're just not profitable you can't depend on your life's existence and your company's existence and your employee's existence on a project that you could put the next five years of R&D into, but because it's open source, once you've finished doing the R&D, your competitor can start up with zero cash and just copy everything you did. You're out of business. You can't survive that. That's why open source dies. That's why open source has so much trouble, because it's hard to get commercial backing for something that your competition can simply wait until you've done all the work and then simply copy what you've done with zero effort and zero cost. You can't compete with that. You have to charge a price that will allow you to recoup your R&D and your development and all your materials purchases while your competition doesn't. He just goes to a manufacturer and says, here's the blueprints, make me this. <laughs> you, you can't compete with that. Um, that's why so many... One of the reasons, even though their actual reasoning was invalid, but they didn't think it was. That's why 3D printing manufacturers don't like sharing the firmware for their printers. They consider their firmware to be their property. They consider it to be their edge. What they have that the other guy can't copy without doing the same work they did. Right? If they can prevent the other guy from copying their firmware, they think that gives them an advantage. It doesn't. Okay? It doesn't. It's a false belief, but they think it does. Because Creality knows, and Anycubic knows, uh, FlashForge knows, that anybody can just copy their printer. Okay? Um, you know, any printer that uses open source can just be copied by anybody else. That's why there's 110 clones for the Ender 3. <laughs> Okay? It's that simple. That's why that happens. Um, why is my mouse not working? Making sure the chat was working correctly. Looks like it had stalled. The, um, this is why it's difficult for companies to use open source things like this, um, because it's difficult to recoup your investment when your competition can exert zero effort and zero expense and just copy everything you do. So they try to hang on to their firmware thinking that gives them an edge. But that's why their printers are better than the clone printer, because their firmware has an edge. It doesn't. 
but they believed it was, and that's why they are so resistant to releasing the firmware and violating um, the incredible amount of work that the Marlin people put into making that firmware that the that, that company is using. The Marlin people are the ones who are being copied to disadvantage <laughs> because these printers only work because of the work the Marlin people put into their firmware. And, um, but that's why open source is a problem. But in a post needs society, open source suddenly becomes a powerhouse. So why does why does free energy and matter replicators strike off World War III? It's simple. Matter replicators effectively reduce the value of everything to zero. What's a piece of gold worth when I can just say, computer, one kilogram of gold, 100% purity, please, and using a little electricity, it makes me gold. All of a sudden, gold has no value whatsoever. It's, it's useful for its industrial capabilities only. That's it. And because it's pretty. <laughs> um, suddenly, it doesn't have the monetary power that it had before. Money becomes absolutely worthless. Um, labor ceases to have value. Um, it's not the same kind of value it has now. I mean... I mean, we don't even need garbage men. The same machine that can take energy and convert it to matter can take matter and convert it to energy. I could just tell my machine, okay, take all my garbage and convert it into oxygen. Release that into the atmosphere. Hey, we just solved global warming too. <laughs> um, but there's one thing that you can't go to a computer and say, computer Earl Grey tea hot. There's one thing you can't do that with. Know what that is? Anybody know what that is? What the one thing that you can't replicate? Land. Land becomes the last reserve of wealth and power. Land becomes the last thing worth. And, and that's what's going to strike off World War III as the entire world fights to collect as much of land as they can because that's the last thing that's worth anything. In fact, it's kind of weird. Um, there are two countries, three countries, that wouldn't really have to be involved in World War III. The United States, China, and India. Because those three countries already have enough land. They'll probably do it anyway just to get more. Um, we'll probably take Canada and take Mexico. So that we hold, we hold the entire continent. But, um... I, I know, I keep thinking that. I keep thinking, what does he know? <laughs> what does he know? Why is he pushing so hard to get the bars? What does he know? <laughs> you guys see IFT3? The, the third fight? It was amazing. Oh my God, that re-entry was phenomenal. Oh, it's, the, it's literally the first time that we actually got to see re-entry. You see, normally you have blackout and re-entry um, because of the plasma generation. And, you know, our typical equipment can't survive there. But two things happened with Starship. Um, two things happened with Starship that were different. One, he's putting cameras on everything, and he's got that Starlink network in orbit. And two, <coughs> Starship is the first thing that we've ever put into space that was so large that there okay so you have the ionis the plasma blackout when you when you hit the earth's atmosphere at you know 23,000 kilometers an hour um that plasma envelops the vessel starship is so big that the plasma cannot entirely envelop the vessel there's a hole, and that hole is big enough to get a radio signal through. So we actually never lost the signal from the Starship due to plasma and ionospheric breakup. We lost the signal because the ship fell apart. Because <laughs> it came in ass first, tits up. <laughs> uh, they got to figure out why that happened. But anyway, we actually got to see it.
we actually got to see the plasma of reentry. We've never seen that before. I mean, think about that. That's something we've never seen before. And it was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I mean, something so energetic and so destructive. It was beautiful. It was it was like like gorgeous, like looking at a sunset, beautiful. I couldn't believe how absolutely beautiful that ethereal plasma forming under the wings. That's something we've never seen before. I mean, as far as, I mean, it's not my money, so of course it's easy to say, but it was worth losing that ship just to see that. I mean, I, mean, I can only imagine the amount of science that's going to come out of that video, out of the data of, of that re-entry. It's, it's going to be amazing. Well, that's what I mean. It's the only time, and, and even in the shuttles, all they can see is the glow because the, the plasma is below them. If they actually saw the plasma in the windshield, they'd be dead because that means they're, <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to be doing that. You're, you're, you're coming in like this. So all the plasma's here. And um, so Starship not only had cameras on board, not only had the ability to transmit that camera data via the Starlink network because it had enough bandwidth, um, but Starship itself, most people don't realize, you think, well, Saturn V. Well, first of all, Starship's twice the size of Saturn V. And second, Saturn V doesn't re-enter the atmosphere. Little command capsule re-enters the atmosphere. Little 17-foot command capsule, however big it is. I don't remember how big it is. Very small. The, the rocket doesn't re-enter the atmosphere. Little command capsule does. But with Starship... This enormous fucking rocket is re-entering the atmosphere. Bigger than the space shuttle. <laughs> you could put the space shuttle in the cargo bay of Starship. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's so... Hey, Joe. It's so big. It's just incredible. It's just... That was amazing. That, and, they, they, and as far as rockets go, they completely succeeded. The booster did its job, separated. Starship made it to orbit. It basically made it to orbit. They intentionally cut short a little bit for just the reason you saw. If they lost control, they wanted to make sure this thing was going to re-enter and burn up and not become a danger in orbit. But they've done it. If they did not have, if they did not have reusability as a goal, Starship's already successful. We can now put 120 tons into orbit. <laughs> We could take the space shuttle, use it as cargo, and put it in orbit. <laughs> I mean, that's just... And, and the Starship's going to be capable of launching over 200 tons into orbit and be recoverable. The Saturn V can only put, I think it was, um, I think 156 tons into low Earth orbit. I think that was the max the Saturn V could do. And if you wanted to go to the moon, the best it can do is that capsule and return module. <laughs> that little tiny thing was the best it can do to get to the moon. It's just the amount of fuel it takes is just incredible. And uh, Starship and Heavy Booster um, make the Saturn V look small. <laughs> and to think the whole thing, the whole entire rocket comes back to Earth to fly again. That's like recovering all the bits of the Saturn V and reusing it. <laughs> no, we throw away the entire rocket. Saturn V, the whole thing is disposable. <laughs> all the, even the capsule is not reusable. <laughs> it's one-time use. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's, and he's doing it on a budget that is a fraction of what NASA spends to fly a rocket. But that's because when, when NASA flies a rocket... They basically have to get it right on the first or second attempt because they're spending billions to make sure it's all right. Um, I told you guys this before. SpaceX is taking, um, well, kind of like a 3D printing type attitude toward um, rocketry. It's what I call junkyard rocketry. Um, they're basically build the damn thing as cheap as possible and blow it up. Just launch it. Who cares if it blows up? We'll learn from it fix it, and blow up another one. And after we blow up enough of them, they'll stop blowing up. Because <laughs> we'll fix everything that made them blow up. 
And people say, well, that's a waste. Yeah, but the amount of money they spend blowing up those 10 rockets is a tiny fraction, a tiny fraction of what NASA spent on Artemis so far. And all they've managed is an unmanned loop around the moon. <laughs> um, and that, 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 that's not a cut on NASA. It's just a different way of doing it. Um, he's taken the path of build dirt cheap rockets and get the flights in. That lets us get the real science in. Instead of spending, you know, a hundred billion dollars testing everything we could possibly test to know this rocket's going to work, instead, we'll spend a couple of million dollars and blow a few rockets up. But now we'll have actual real world data. We see the rocket actually work and can then, emit, instead of having to test and go through a hundred iterations to figure out what's going to work and hope we get it right, we just blow the damn thing up and go, oh, yep, that's wrong. And we fix that thing. That's it. Fixed. <laughs> I mean, look what happened. The first flight, the, um, well, the, the Starship, IFT-2, the Starship blowing up was a mistake. They had extra, um, to simulate the weight of liftoff, they had extra liquid oxygen on board. And it was venting where it shouldn't have been venting and it caused an explosion. So that was just, that was a screw up, a mistake. And, um... The booster failed because of an inadequate eulage burn, and um, or the, the either the need for a eulage burn or a way to avoid the need for a eulage burn, and that's what they did on three. On three, um, the booster worked perfectly. It had a problem on recovery. It had a problem reigniting the engines. They'll figure out what went wrong and they'll fix that, just like they did with the Falcon rocket. But um, you know, nine tenths of the way, the booster worked perfectly. It launched the rocket up into space. All 33 engines worked perfectly. Hot staging worked perfectly. Boost back worked perfectly. Atmospheric reentry worked perfectly. They just didn't stick the landing. What they're probably going to find out is that um, atmospheric reentry damaged something. If I had to guess, unless it's something that they can protect somehow with a modification, if I had to guess, they're going to do a re-entry burn. They're going to do a short burn at atmospheric interface, which is going to do two things. One, it's going to slow the rocket down so atmospheric re-entry is not so harsh. Because Super Heavy is a whole lot heavier than a Falcon 1 first day. Um, so um, if I were to guess, this is seat of my pants guess, they're going to initiate a re-entry burn to slow the rocket down, and that burn will protect the rocket from a lot of that re-entry force. That would be my guess, that they're going to initiate a re-entry burn. Uh, unless they simply don't have enough fuel, they can't do that, then they'll have to find another way to do it. But my suspicion is that the Super Heavy, because of how big and heavy it is, I mean, look how fast it got going when it re-entered. Now go look at the um, re-entry speeds of Falcon 1, or Falcon, Falcon when it re-enters. Totally different ballgame. I think that's what bit him in the butt. Because otherwise, it worked perfectly all the way down. Um, so they they pretty much licked Super Heavy. They got a couple things to fix. And um, we still don't know what happened with Starship. Something caused it to start tumbling, and it seemed unable to correct the tumble. Don't know why. And even once it started re-entering, you could see the, the fins. They were activating, trying to do their thing. They were trying to correct the roll, but they just couldn't in time. They might not have enough control authority. There might be enough atmosphere to destroy the ship, but not enough atmosphere to give the flaps the control authority they need to correct the orientation of the rocket. Because it is a big, heavy rocket. So they'll have to figure out what caused that. Probably something went wrong with the RCS system. Something vented, something broke. We see a lot of venting going on. We don't know what the deal is with that. Um, but for some reason, it, it had a... Um, Two axis roll that it couldn't seem to correct. But yeah, I'm I'm thrilled for four. <laughs> I can't wait till they try again. And they're probably gonna try again in three months or so. We're, we're, we're figuring less than three months they'll try it again. Um they expect maybe less than two months. They're planning for six more Starship flights this year. That's gonna be amazing. <laughs> I can't wait. That's gonna um, stage zero is getting better and better every time they do it. 
um, less damage each time, you know, as they figure out what the weak points are and correct it. Stage zero is the launch pad. But yeah, the, the junkyard rocketry, it's working. They're building new rockets for a fraction of the price, a fraction of the R&D investment, and they're learning from actual flights, which means they get, it's like, it's like um, if you're looking at a problem that's theoretical and you have, you know, a hundred different possible futures, and you got to figure out which of those futures you can test for and correct for. Well, if you just built one and launched it, now you have two futures. That's a fail. Figure out what failed and you succeed. Um, it seems more expensive at the start because you just blew up an entire rocket, but then when you realize what they spent on those rockets versus what NASA spends on rockets, you realize they can blow up a hundred of these and still be under budget for Artemis. <laughs> and they won't have to blow up a hundred. They, they won't have to do that. I mean, look, and, but look how fast they're building them. They have them stacked up in line waiting to be flown. <laughs> and some of their flights obsolete a rocket before it's even flown. Like, well, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. They fly this and realize, oh yeah, we gotta change this because we already know that's not gonna work. <laughs> the, 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 the iteration, the, the iteration advancement is just incredible. They're going so fast, it's, it's pretty impressive. Now, where NASA is gonna really come in handy um, is when we start putting people on Mars. Because that's where you... You, you don't want live test subjects, like we were talking about earlier. You, you kind of want to know they're going to live before you send them. Because, you know, launching a bunch of people to Mars to have them die, that would be bad optics. <laughs> so they, they kind of need to figure that out first. So hopefully NASA will do the work on that, because that's something NASA's good at. <laughs> but building cheap rockets... I thought the SpaceX is good at. <coughs> and it's obviously profitable enough that even with the success of SpaceX, you have a dozen other companies all trying to do the same thing. You know, make commercial rockets viable. Reusable commercial rockets. Um, because there's, there's money to be made if you can do it cheaply. You know, what, what did it cost to put something into space with the space shuttle? Um, $10,000 a pound. It was 10, if you wanted to, if you wanted to launch this bottle on the space shuttle, it cost you $10,000. Put that bottle in space. Falcon 9 can put that bottle in space for 100 bucks. <laughs> it's... Uh, Maybe not quite that cheap yet, but it's 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 there. It's it's very very affordable. And as the rockets get more and more reusable, it gets cheaper and cheaper. How do you think? Uh, how do you think Elon Musk is able to launch his own massive global satellite Starlink network? How do you think he's able to afford that? He uses all re he uses all boosters that have already been flown. So that booster had already been paid for. A client already paid for that booster to put their satellite into space. And so now all he has to pay for is the refurbishment and some more oxygen and methane. <laughs> and the cost of that is a fraction of the initial cost. And so he's in, that, that, that reusability allow, literally is allowing him to build a Starlink network. And even though it's, it's expensive... You know, Starlink is not cheap. Um, it costs a fraction of what all previous satellite internet um, accounts cost. A fraction. And it's unlimited. And it's actually broadband speed. So, yeah, that, that reusability and cheap iteration of rockets is... That, that's a thing. It's not going anywhere. That, that, that's something that's going to stick around. Absolutely amazing. Just absolutely amazing. All right, Critters, it's almost 3 o'clock. I'm going to get out of here. Uh, we are one month away from Rocky Mountain Rep Rap Festival. So um, if you're going to be going there, I'll be there. And I'll bring my cinder block. I'll bring my blocks. bring my little weight set. I'll bring some rockets. And I'll have a table there. Yeah. 
This time I'll remember to bring my business cards. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the last time. That was dumb. But um, yeah, it's gonna be fun. I have a feeling it's gonna be big. The I mean, it was big last year, and it wasn't even totally filled up. But people were unsure about it, but it was so popular. I think it's going to be big. So hopefully they can handle it and manage it. Thunderfoot. Oh, Thunderfoot's full of shit half the time. Give me a... <laughs> I mean, he's not a dummy. He's a smart guy. But um, he's pretty much dead wrong about anything SpaceX. I mean, I mean they're doing it. <laughs> Wait, you think they're spending tens of millions of dollars on a Lark? They're doing it. The rockets are flying. So, you know, if, if he poo-poos their rockets, then, you know, he's full of it. That's, that's how he makes his video. Oh, really? They got a bigger place? Nice! Fantastic. I'm glad they planned for that. I expect the vendor show up to be a lot bigger. Because a lot of vendors were unsure. You, know, you gotta understand, there's, there's now um, three rep rap festivals. You have East Coast rep rap, you have Midwest rep rap, and you have Rocky Mountain rep rap. And isn't there another one? Didn't, uh, didn't one get started up in California or something like that? Or has it not started yet? Oh, I hate second halls. That's annoying, but, you know, they got to do what they got to do. When you separate the two halls, one usually takes primary. No, I'm talking about in the U.S. Although for the bigger companies, U.K. one is a factor as well. Um... For, especially for the you know companies like Creality and um, um, Polymaker and stuff like that, you know they've got money; they can afford to be a a display at shows like this. But a lot of these smaller companies, um, going to multiple events is hard. You know, for for a small company to go to an event like this that's not local, it's it's a dramatic expense. It's very very expensive. Imagine, pick a rep rep festival that's not close to you. Now, start adding up the costs of going to that rep rep festival. Car, rental, fuel, hotel, lodging, airplane, all of that. Because you're going to have to rent it all. Um, add up those costs. Now, multiply it by the number of people you're bringing with you. Bring four employees with you. You need lodging for them all. You need food for them all. You need transportation for them all. You need cars for them all. You know, for a, for a company, going to multiple events really hard. It's expensive. It's it's not like a um, a petty cash expense like it might be for Creality or um, E3 or somebody like that. You know, people who have an act. It's it's an expense for them too, but they have an actual budget. Um, they can, they can justify that expense. Smaller companies. Going to one more event could be the difference between whether they make profit this year or whether they don't make profit this year. So if they make a mistake and go to an event that doesn't give returns, it hurts them. It can even kill them. Um, so a lot of vendors were hesitant last year, especially the smaller guys. A lot of what you saw was locals and the people who could afford to travel. But because of how successful it was, I expect we're going to see a big boost this year. I expect a lot of vendors going to show up. It's going to, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> so, Alright, I haven't had breakfast yet, so I'm going to go make something to eat. And I will see you guys next week. That model should be finished by next week. I'm going to, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a, a second type of handle that's thinner. For people who need the um, thinner to hang on to. And I'm going to print the caps now that we no longer have a need to actually use soda bottle caps. So that um, I can make it all tighten up. And um, that should be finished by next week. And I will post those files so people can play around with it. Go from there. So I will see you guys next week. Thank you for joining in. And keep your victims happy.